thank you, Ramon. Uh, everyone, it's uh, uh, nice to be back. I will also say, having been coming here for seven years or whatever it is, um, it's never once rained during the summer school, I think. Uh, so um, consider yourselves, uh, um, well, be getting to experience something very unique. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let me just start out by uh, saying the point of what this lecture is. So you've heard a lot of applications, really, since day one. Uh, the evening talks where people have been talking about cutting edge research in uh, natural language processing and machine learning have all been relying on uh, very sophisticated tech techniques uh, uh, from deep learning to, to model the phenomena that they're interested in. Um, what we're going to do this morning is really go in and look in detail uh, at what's going on under the hood and uh, understand some of these models um, in, in detail. Um, and you may think, well, I can just download PyTorch or whatever, uh, TensorFlow, and uh, somebody will have taken care of this uh, for me. But, uh, you know, really, if, um, you know, I'm now at that point in my life where, you know, we've seen things change a bunch. And uh, you actually have to understand what's going on under the hood if you want to uh, be part of the big uh, progressions from sort of one paradigm uh, to the next and really understand how to, how to solve these problems in a, in a fundamental way. So. Um, you know, this will be, uh, on one hand, uh, material that's a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit basic, but it's uh, important to think at the basic level about what's going on to really uh, appreciate, uh, to think about the fundamentals to really understand how to use these techniques. Um, so the outline of the lecture, um, which is broken into two parts, we've got the break in the middle. Um, we're going to talk about uh, my view of uh, modeling sequences is to think about recurrent neural networks as inducing features of uh, histories of, uh, of states. And uh, we will use language modeling, just unconditional language modeling, as our motivating uh, application. It's not really an application as much as just a modeling challenge. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the uh, learning challenges and solutions that exist. So in particular, how you encourage these models, how you change them so that they learn uh, better long-range uh, models. So if you have something that uh, triggers uh, that says, oh, something's going to happen way later, how do you remember that? How do you learn to be sensitive to that sort of thing? And this kind of analysis is really interesting because uh, it shows what kind of uh, analysis you can do when you find a problem a failure mode uh, in one of your models, what you can do to it in order to improve its performance. Um, after the break, uh, we will talk about conditional sequence models. And these are basically all of the applications, as nearly as I can tell, that you've seen this week um, have been applications of what I'm calling conditional sequence models. Um, so translation, uh, uh, natural language generation, uh, any of this sort of stuff. Uh, is a uh, conditional sequence modeling problem. Um, there are some interesting algorithmic challenges here that are worth understanding, uh, so we'll talk about that. Um, and then we'll talk about all this stuff. Everybody's been talking about attention, and we'll go into the details of what that actually is, and that's basically um, going to be the, uh, the morning. So <clears throat> let's uh, talk about uh, sequential data. Um, so I would actually say most uh, interesting data in the world is sequential in nature, or you can uh, make it sequential. So obviously, uh, you know, the focus of this uh, summer school, or the uh, somewhat uh, it's uh, colored uh, by its focus on natural language. Um, so we can think of words and sentences, or words and documents, or sentences and documents, or conversations. These are obviously naturally represented uh, as sequences. Uh, there are things in the natural world, like DNA, that have a sequential character. Um, if you want to go out and, uh, I don't know, make some money maybe, you know, things like stock market returns are, uh, you know, that's a time series as well. Um, but, you know, really tons of stuff. So actions taken by an agent playing a game or the Roomba cleaning your room, um, that's a s sequence of actions. Um, there's a really cool uh, technique for generating uh, synthesized speech that came out of uh, DeepMind in the last couple of years, where they viewed the amplitudes that make up the sound waves this, as, a, as a very, very fast, uh, high-rate um, sequence problem, and they modeled that sequence. Um, you can even think about an image as a sequence of pixels, so you can just like go from left to right uh, through the image, and so all of this stuff uh, can be viewed uh, sequentially. Um, so. Uh, we want to be able to model this. Uh, if we can model this sort of thing, we can deal with a lot of really interesting stuff uh, in the world. 
Um, now, in some applications, we want to uh, condition on sequential data and make a prediction. So we might, for example, a classic task in NLP is read a review and predict whether it's positive or negative. Uh, this is uh, you know, automatic sentiment analysis. So the, the review is a sequence of words or characters, and then we make a single prediction by, by reading about it. And this may sound like a toy problem, but there is actually a lot of money to be made uh, if that's your sort of thing. There's also a lot of really interesting stuff people communicate about their preferences uh, in very subtle and uh, sophisticated ways, and being able to model that is a, is a very fascinating uh, problem. Uh, there's been a long-standing problem uh, in, in language of uh, actually authorship detection. So, uh, you know, I come from the United States originally where um, we our founding documents were written in some cases anonymously, and there have been big debates over who wrote uh, a set of these early papers, uh, was it Thomas Jefferson or Al Alexander Hamilton, and people, statisticians largely, have been talking about this for 200 years. Um, we, can, uh, we can think about this as read the document, make a prediction, who wrote it? Thomas Jefferson? Um, okay, but in other applications, we want to generate sequential data. So, um, you know, we've talked about uh, things like simple problems, like part of speech tagging, uh, and we've seen some nice techniques, hidden Markov models, as a way of, uh, of solving this problem. Uh, but of course, uh, real uh, applications like machine translation, you want to generate a sequence of words that uh, produce the translation. Um, yesterday, Sasha gave some examples of producing uh, summaries, uh, either of databases or of uh, longer documents. Uh, all of these things can be seen as, uh, uh, as examples of uh, sequence generation. And uh, the other thing to note is that in many cases, uh, we want to do both of these things. So when we're doing a summarization problem, we read a document a sequence and then we generate uh, a sequence as well. So <coughs> what can we do to solve both of these problems? Um, before I answer that, I'm going to say, I'm going to step back and talk about a classic modeling problem where we're going to generate a sequence. Um, so, uh, talk about language models. So, a language model generates or assigns a probability to a sequence of words, uh, W1 through, say, WL. So, um, and uh, usually, but not always, there are many ways to actually solve this problem, um, but it's often convenient to use the chain rule for probability uh, to decompose this. And uh, the chain rule can be applied in a whole bunch of different ways, but we typically make this causal assumption where we order the sentence uh, from left to right, as one does when writing or speaking or thinking, I guess. Uh, we start with the first word, we uh, model its probability, then we generate the second word, conditional on the first word, then the third word, conditional on the first two words. This uh, probabilistic identity holds, of course, with, uh, with equality, assuming that we can, uh, um, we, we can represent those probability distributions. Um, but for us as engineers and machine learning researchers, uh, the chain rule reduces the language modeling problem uh, to modeling the probability of the next word given the history of preceding words. And what is the history of pre preceding words but a sequence? So this is a technique, of course, that I picked language models because I work on natural language, but you can do this to model any uh, sort of uh, uh, sequential data. So the reason I bring this up here is that um, for conditioning problems, we obviously need to be able to represent a sequence, right? Um, but for generation problems, we also just need to be able to represent um, a sequence because we want to be able to say, well, if I've given, if I've got this sequence of history, what happens next? And if you do that forever, you've got a model of, well, the world, I guess. Um, so the question is, how do we represent arbitrarily long histories, arbitrarily long sequences. And the answer today is going to be, we're going to train neural networks to build representations of sequences of unbounded length. And um, so this idea of uh, neural networks as representation learning, uh, uh, I think is, um, you know, there are a couple of ways of thinking about them. I think this is a really nice way uh, of thinking about things. Um, and let me just give you sort of a little bit of an overview of how I think about neural networks as feature inducers, um, and maybe that'll make sure we're kind of all on the same page. So let's go back to linear regression. Um, I'm pretty sure you guys covered this on the first day and have probably seen this dozens of times uh, since, I don't know, they teach it in kindergarten now. Um, but uh, 
So uh, basically, it's this uh, expression up here, uh, why this prediction y hat uh, is this matrix W times a vector of features x plus a bias vector uh, B. And then this is trained uh, to minimize this, uh, um, this squared error, so the square of the residuals between the predictions and the, and the true values. Um, and the, so we do this by learning uh, values of W and B um, such that F is minimized for some data set consisting here of M uh, training instances. And of course, there are many, many algorithms uh, for doing this. You can use backpropagation, which is uh, sort of what most of us do these days, I think, at least in our field. Um, but the, uh, the problem with linear regression is uh, it assumes that there's a linear relationship uh, or generalizations of lines to higher dimensions if you're working, if X has many dimensions, uh, so like a planar, hyperplanar relationship uh, between uh, X and Y. And you just have to learn the, uh, the slope and the, uh, the slopes and the, uh, uh, and the intercepts to, uh, to then do this uh, modeling problem. Uh, but if, you, uh, if your data comes in a form where the inputs are not in a linear relationship uh, to the outputs, um, then you have to start engineering special features such that that linear relationship uh, kinds of, uh, kind of holds. Um, and in the not very distant past, a lot of us spent a lot of time thinking about clever features. And we were really impressed with ourselves when we would write a paper when we came up with a good feature that made this linearity assumption a little bit more reasonable. Um, but another way of solving this problem is what you might call a nonlinear regression, where we com first compute a vector h, which uh, is just some transformed version of x, linearly transformed version of x. We add a bias to it, so it's an affine transformation of x, and then pass through a nonlinearity, say tan h, um, and that then is fed into this linear regression uh, equation. So the, the idea here in this formulation is that we're going to use naive or basic features x and learn their transformation uh, into, um, into h. Um, and uh, effectively what's going on here is that first learner is in charge of making sure that the features that I used to have to create by hand are are available to the regression model. And uh, everything is learned via backpropagation, usually. So one thing that's worth noting is uh, that this is actually, a, it looks so simple. It looks like a minor variant of linear regression. Um, but it's actually a sort of limitlessly powerful uh, expression. So um, there was some theory from uh, quite a while ago now uh, that showed that if H is big enough, that is if it has enough dimensions, and of course you've got kind of enough training data and, enough, and a really good learner, um, it can actually represent any vector valued function to any degree of precision. Um, that's a far cry from the assumption of linearity that we uh, had originally, uh, originally had. So this can, in principle, solve all of your problems ever, all of your regression problems ever. Now, of course, there's no free lunch. You probably uh, don't have enough data to, uh, to train this. Uh, the uh, relationship may not be deterministic that you're interested in modeling. All of this stuff uh, is, a big, uh, is a big problem, but it's still uh, quite powerful. But the thing I want you to take away from this little intro here is that you can think of what H is doing here in this expression as inducing features in a linear classifier. So the network is doing the job of a feature engineer. So there's a lot of talk of uh, AI and machine learning automating, um, uh, automating our you know, jobs away. But uh, so far, the, uh, it's certainly the case that uh, you know, what my job used to be has been automated away. And I'm very happy about that because it wasn't the fun part of the, the work. Um, so um, all right. So here is a graphical representation of a feed-forward neural network. So um, the way you can uh, parse out my visual language here is uh, arrows represent uh, uh, matrix multiplies plus a, an addition of a bias, um, followed by usually some kind of nonlinearity. So and the boxes represent uh, uh, vectors that we're that we're computing. So we've got an x vector. We transform it to compute an h vector. Then we transform it again to compute uh, a y vector. And uh, so we can we can see it like this. 
Um, now, we're going to introduce here the notion of a recurrent neural network, um, which is going to add this interesting self-loop here uh, in the middle. Um, and you can see the expression uh, up here where uh, now when we're computing H, uh, rather than just having this transformed version of the input uh, XT, we're also going to have a transformed version of the previous value of HT. Um, and then we'll, we'll add a bias. And one, one thing to note here is it's uh, convenient often computationally and just notationally uh, to combine uh, these, this XT and HT and think of these all as sort of the relevant inputs for this current time step. Um, and then we concatenate those together to a big vector and then have just one transformation matrix. It's just a notational uh, equivalent here. Um, and then we, uh, we go on. So basically, what we've got here now is when we're representing uh, the value of this hidden state, it's going to depend on the previous values of this hidden state. So the, um, this doesn't make sense. You can't use this as a drop-in replacement in a linear regression problem because you have to have this temporal dimension here. So you have to be, um, you have to be in the world of sequences here. Um, so, of course, we're in the world of sequences today, so it's exactly uh, the model we've, uh, we want. So, um, how do we actually use this model? Well, um, let's imagine we've got a sequence of data, um, a sequence of inputs, x1, x2, x3, we'll go up to x4 today. Um, so, how do we use this? Well, let's start with x1, we're going to feed it in, and we want to compute um, using this equation uh, h1. Uh, well, it says we should take x1 and we should add to it h t minus 1. What's h t minus 1? Do we have an h0? No. We better add it. So um, we're going to put that down here. Often this is a zero vector. It can also be a learned vector. It depends on your problem. Usually if you have enough data, it's better to learn these sorts of things. Um, and uh, so we have, a, uh, we have a base case for this uh, recursive definition um, of, of h t. Um, and then we predict uh, y t minus 1. Now we can observe uh, x2, and we uh, feed this in, and we compute h2, uh, and then y2 from that. And uh, this process uh, continues for as long as it wants, basically. Um, so this is sometimes called unrolling the uh, recurrent neural network. Um, but the other thing to note here is that uh, the characteristic form of the RNN is, has this kind of loopy structure to it. But when we actually apply real data to it, um, it, just it just rolls out like a regular feed-forward neural network. So you could imagine uh, you know, implementing this in, in code and, uh, um, and making predictions from it if you, had, uh, if you had some parameters. But where do those parameters come from? Stick with me. Um, OK, we're going to assume now that we have, with our uh, with our sequence of x1 through x4, we're going to be generating these outputs y1, y2, y3, y4. So maybe we are uh, doing something like um, predicting the chance, uh, let's see, predicting the average temperature in, uh, in Lisbon, where x1 is the uh, temperature in day one, and y1 is going to be the weather uh, prediction for, uh, for day two. Um, so we've then also going to assume that we have some historical data, so we're going to be able to have targets that actually say what happened. And then we're going to compute using the prediction and the target, we're going to compute some loss. Now, you've heard tons about loss functions this week. You can pick, in general, any differentiable uh, function that uh, computes a scalar, valid, uh, scalar value here to be uh, your cost function, and we can optimize this. And in contrast to maybe some of the other problems you've dealt with, we're going to assume that we have a sequence of these things. Um, and when we've got many uh, loss functions that are these time-locked losses, all we have to do is aggregate them over time into an aggregate loss. And all we do is we, we sum these together. Um, so now what we've got is some inputs, the x's. We've got some targets, the y's. We have some predictions that are being made by the model and this cost function. And all of these things are being aggregated together uh, across the whole sequence into a single cost function, this script f here. And then 
This doesn't have any loops in it, so we can run the backpropagation algorithm. And uh, we can differentiate f with respect to all of the parameters that make up this model. So um, we run, uh, starting from f, we differentiate f with respect to itself. Of course, that's 1. Then we use the chain rule and backpropagation to compute the derivatives with respect to the uh, internal activations, the internal nodes in that graph, and then eventually the parameters that gave rise to them. Uh, and that gives us the gradients that we can use to take our, uh, our update steps. So um, one thing uh, that's very important to note here is that parameters are tied across time here. So when we go from time step 1 to time step 2, we're using the same transition matrix, the same update to the weight, that same U, that we used, uh, we used that same one across all time steps. And this is what makes this model so powerful, because it means that if this is well trained, even if we only ever saw sequences up to, say, length 10, at uh, training time, at testing time, we'll at least be able to compute values of sequences of any arbitrary length. And uh, the question of how well uh, models generalize uh, up to longer and longer sequences is actually a really important one, uh, and one that is far from resolved. But uh, in principle, at least, we have the ability to compute things for sequences of, of any length. Um, and by the way, when we do backpropagation like this, this is traditionally called backpropagation through time. You don't always see this term uh, used anymore. Uh, people will often refer to it now for truncated backpropagation through time because often you don't want to backpropagate through if you've got, say, something that's uh, modeling sequences that are thousands of uh, uh, time steps long. You don't want to. Uh, you don't want to have to backpropagate through sort of everything. Um, so, uh, is all this clear so far? Does anyone have any questions? Feel free to interrupt me. I, I know it's a little, this is a, not a great auditorium for asking questions, but I actually like a little bit of interaction. I'll force you to answer some questions in a second. Um, okay, so what does a parameter tying actually mean uh, in, in a little more detail? So let's look at this parameter u. Uh, in this uh, recurrent neural network um, equation. Now, we didn't actually draw you in this graph. In my graphical language, those are sort of hidden inside of those arrows. But I'm going to add you into the, into the figure now so you can sort of see the dependencies on it. So there's this U matrix sitting off to the side here. And every time H1 or H2 or any H is computed, uh, U is actually uh, used to, to make that computation, right? So. <coughs> Um, how do we, what do the, when we run back propagation on this, what happens? Well, the derivative of f with respect to u is just going to be the sum of the derivatives with respect to u uh, ba from everywhere that u is used. So u is used uh, in, uh, to compute the values of h1, h2, h3, and h4. We're going to uh, compute derivatives of the loss with respect to those hidden activations, multiply those by the derivatives of H with respect to, to U, um, and then aggregate those to get the total derivative of uh, F with respect uh, to U. Um, so this is actually quite familiar with uh, uh, the what we see in uh, convolutional networks. So um, I think Biksha covered those uh, with you. And uh, when you're sliding these filters across your signal, uh, you're using the same filter at every time step. So they're tied across time steps. It's the same principle uh, at work here. OK, so um, as I said, we want to tie these parameters because we want to deal with arbitrary long sequences. But another important reason is that we want to reduce the number of parameters uh, to be learned. Um, in some cases, we might uh, also think that uh, there is a certain kind of invariance, that processes are sometimes what's called homogeneous. So if something happens at any time step, the way you should respond to it should be the same anywhere. It shouldn't like matter that it's at time step 17 versus time step 472. It's all you think, uh, whenever this happens, you should do x. So that encourages, uh, that uh, builds into the model this notion that the same thing happens uh, in a context-independent way. Um, now, you might ask yourselves, what if we always have short sequences? Um, couldn't we just learn like time-specific uh, parameters? Well, certainly you could, but then you wouldn't actually have an RNN anymore. Um, and, uh, you, but you do want to think uh, in 
some care of like, do you think that your model, uh, that the data you're modeling is, uh, has responses that should be very strongly determined by time or that are really independent across time? So you want to understand what's going on under the, under the covers uh, when you make decisions um, about things like this. Um, okay, <clears throat> so uh, what can we also do with uh, recurrent neural networks? So a common motif uh, is that we don't just have uh, at every time step some kind of prediction uh, to go along with our input, and that's perfectly fine. Um, in fact, a very important technique is uh, this read and summarize technique. So. Um, what you can, uh, what you often have is just a single target at the end. So go back to our, our sentiment classification example that we started with, where you might want to read a sequence of words in a document and then make a prediction about what the sentiment of the, uh, of the document was. Well, we can feed in the words represented as vectors x1, x2, x3 up until the end. And then that h1, h2, h3, h4, uh, should learn to track everything that everything relevant that happened uh, in the document. But once we've read the whole document, we should have enough information to make the prediction. So at that point, we then compute our prediction, and at training time, we're going to assume that we have some target predictions that we want to uh, uh, compare to, and so we can back propagate through uh, through all of this. So um, a very important. Uh, application of recurrent neural networks is summarizing a sequence uh, into a single vector. Um, of course, we don't just have to take the final vector for a problem like this. Another thing we can do is uh, take a maximum across, an uh, element-wise maximum across the vectors at every time step. So all of these vectors are exactly the same size. Um, max is a almost differentiable operation in the technical sense of almost differentiable. Um, you can also replace that max operation with summation or averaging or any other sort of uh, differentiable operation. And that'll give you a vector that represents everything. And in some cases, actually, I will tell you max is the thing you usually want to do if you're interested in summarizing kind of a whole global document at once. I don't know why it works better than averaging or summation or things like that, but uh, um, it's, it's often the best. Um, and uh, then we get a and then we get a vector that we can make predictions on, um, and so you can train all of this stuff uh, via via backpropagation. So another um, thing to stop and take note of here is what we've done is we have um, used a recursive definition of a list to build a neural network architecture for representing the list. And I just want to stop. Um, so as I said, a lot of important data in the universe is sequential in nature. But this is a big group. I am quite sure that some of you are going to go off and uh, work on uh, data sets that have maybe a different kind of natural structure. Maybe you want to work with graphs or trees or some other exotic uh, data structure. Um, and uh, the trick that we used of a, a recursive definition to construct a neural net uh, can actually be applied to those problems uh, as well. And uh, I will say um, we're starting to see more graph structured neural networks, uh, but because of hardware limitations and toolkit limitations, uh, this is still an open area of research. So if you want to make a mark, this is actually something to think about. But uh, here's a general recipe for constructing an architecture that sort of universally valid. So um, first, just to see how this works with lists. So recall the recursive definition of a list. So we've got a base case. The, this empty list uh, is a list. Um, then we have this inductive step where we say that uh, t appended to h on the left, where t is a list, uh, the tail, and h is an atom, uh, is also a list. Um, and so if you go, you know, those of you who are like functional programmers probably will say, yeah, this is the way to think about stuff. Um, I find it unnatural and weird. Um, but uh, RNNs basically define functions that compute representations recursively according to exactly this definition of a list. They define or learn a representation of the base case. That was that H0 that we started with. Um, and then they learned a representation of the inductive step. They said, well, we're going to have a representation by uh, hypothesis of 
uh, a list already the, the of t. Um, and then we're going to add to it one more thing. So that uh, in our uh, model, so h t minus 1 is our representation of t. And then our representation of h is just x t. Um, and we have a uh, st we have a thing that computes a new representation uh, of the same type, that is of the same um, uh, same uh, dimension, uh, and that is uh, then uh, a recursive uh, definition of an Im of a representation of that list. And so, pr as long as you've got then some data that you can pair this with, uh, that you can take these uh, the final representation of your data set and make some prediction, compute some loss, and backpropagate, you can learn to embed any complex data structure you want. Um, so basically, the, the lesson here is anything that you can construct recursively, you can follow this recipe and obtain an embedding or a representation with neural networks using this general strategy. Uh, and so uh, this has been applied to graphs and things like that, but there's still a ton of work uh, to, be, to be done here. Um, OK, <clears throat> so let's um, go back and talk uh, about how we're going to use uh, RNNs, the recurrent neural networks we've just defined to do language modeling. So this is just the language modeling slide you saw before. We're going to, again, work with this uh, decomposition. So now you should start saying, aha, this looks a little bit like RNNs, right? At each step, we're conditioning on a representation of the past, and we're adding one more thing into the future. That is exactly what we were doing uh, with, with RNNs. So um, let's just talk generally about how, think about, so before we uh, talk about doing this with RNNs, let's talk about the estimation problem that we face. So how do we represent the probability of WT given some history? So um, the traditional approach that uh, has been incredibly important has been to make a, uh, a Markov assumption. So I put uh, this picture of Andre uh, down here, Andre Markov down here the bottom of the slide. Um, and this is a conditional independence assumption. And it basically says, at every time step, you're going, you are allowed to forget the conditional past, the distant past. So how far is the distant past? Well, that's up to you to say. So here I say everything that happened more than one word ago is the distant past. And uh, is this valid for language? No, it's certainly not. We can think of many examples where you need to know, you need to remember something that happened a long time ago um, that uh, uh, in order to make a good decision about uh, what comes later. So a simple example is if you start a sentence with a question word like what, and then you want to generate the punctuation that ends the sentence, you probably want to know if you start it with a question word because it'll tell you whether you should end with a period or a question mark. Um, so even though it is not valid for language, it's uh, often very practical. And uh, one of the reasons it's very practical is we now have the, all of our probability distributions are basically these bigram models where we just want to estimate the probability of transitioning from one word to the next. And then we can use those statistics to model sentences of arbitrary length, which is a really, which is a really cool thing. So we can reduce the number of statistics that we need to estimate. Um, and in fact, we can reduce it so far that rather than trying to estimate these uh, statistics using sophisticated text like, techniques like neural networks, you often just count and normalize and use these maximum likelihood estimates or things fairly close to it uh, to, to estimate these probability distributions. Of course, you can represent these things using, uh, using neural networks. And in fact, some of the, uh, early most, uh, some of the most early influential work on uh, practical language modeling with neural networks made exactly this Markov assumption. Just rather than counting and normalize, each one of those was estimated with a little feed-forward neural network. So all of this stuff is possible. Um, anything you can do in probability. Probability is like the starting point, and neural networks are a way of instantiating probabilistic models. So it's important to think at this level of abstraction, too. OK, but why are RNNs great? Well. They mean you don't have to ever make another Markov <coughs> assumption uh, in your life. And usually, we don't miss them, because Markov assumptions are really uncomfortable things, although those of us who also like to work on the algorithmic side of things miss them, because Markov assumptions often give you really fast algorithms um, that we can no longer run. 
OK, so how do history-based RNNs, uh, history-based language models with RNNs work? So this should look very familiar. This is basically our R unrolled um, RNN. Um, now we've just augmented it with uh, a few more language-specific things. So down at the bottom, what you'll see is the sequence of uh, these circles with Ws in them. So those are the history. Those are the words: word one, two, three, and four. Um, I'm using this probabilistic uh, graphical model notation, where these shaded things mean we've observed this. So this is a particular context: W1 through four. Um, and uh, then these vectors that I've labeled uh, with a uh, boldface uh, uh, W, uh, those are uh, word embeddings. So those can be your favorite word embeddings. Uh, in practice, when we train a language model, we don't use pre-trained word embeddings. Uh, we just uh, learn these as free parameters of the model. Um, and that's because when all of the uh, work on training uh, word embeddings uses variations of language modeling objectives uh, to begin with. So, uh, you know, if you've got language to train word embeddings, you might as well just directly train uh, your, your language model. Um, we've got our hidden state. Um, so things get interesting at the end. Uh, so now we've conditioned on, say, four words of history, and now we want to predict the distribution uh, over the fifth uh, word. So first, before we actually predict the word, we predict the distribution over all the words that might happen at this time point. And uh, we're going to uh, zoom in and see what, uh, what happens here uh, just a little bit. Um, more closely. Um, so here we've now transposed this on the side. So we've got our H and we're projecting this out onto uh, a uh, vector of length V, the size of a vocabulary. So we're assuming in neural language models, um, we almost always assume that we have a closed vocabulary. In fact, as far as I know, we always assume that um, uh, because we are going to then uh, generate, uh, convert this into a probability distribution by uh, renormalizing with the softmax uh, function. So these then make uh, the, by transforming this vector uh, into, uh, with the softmax function, uh, we end up with the parameters of a categorical or multinomial distribution here. So all of them have, uh, are greater than zero and uh, they sum up to one. Um, and I actually love this um, <coughs> uh, citation. Actually, it's cut off in the left here. It's a uh, bridal, um, 1990. This is even simple ideas like the softmax were proposed once for the first time. Uh, and uh, um, it's not actually that long ago that this happened, especially if you consider how long neural networks had been. But I wanted to read uh, part of this. Um, basically. Uh, he says, uh, you know, generalizes this uh, notion of uh, maximum picking or this argmax operation in a way that uh, is, is differentiable, um, but it also gives you these probabilistic uh, semantics. Um, he says, although it looks rather cumbersome and perhaps not really in the spirit of neural networks, um, those familiar with Markov random fields will uh, know its convenient mathematical properties. Um, I thought this part about not really in the spirit of neural networks uh, as, as being quite interesting. So in the early days, people were really obsessed by this notion of, uh, you know, all of, the all of the neurons computing their activations independently of everything else that's going on in the network. And they thought of each neuron as really the one scalar value. Maybe it was inside of a vector for notational convenience, but they were really all independent. And the softmax kind of mushes them all together and says, you have to worry about what your neighbors are doing in order to compute your activation. And uh, so uh, it, was, it was interesting to see sort of what people's aesthetics were telling them they should or shouldn't do uh, in, the, in these early days. And now we use this all the time. This is one of the major workhorses of, uh, of neural networks. And if you don't use this, things work uh, far, far worse. Anyway, it's a nice, nice paper if you want to go and, go and find it. Um, okay, so here's our, uh, here's our probability of a sequence. Uh, now I'm calling it, calling it E for, I guess, English words. Um, and uh, the other thing I'll note here is that the histories, uh, so each of these H's that we're going to be encountering when we compute this uh, probability distribution over the next thing, we're taking this value H. Um, those are just going to be the historical sequences of words uh, at that time step. And... Um, and that's going to uh, that's going to be encoded by by the RNN. But then we're going to be applying the same transformation of H 
at every step uh, by projecting it out onto this vocabulary and then renormalizing it to, uh, uh, to a probability distribution. Okay, so quick uh, to see if you're paying attention here. So um, if H is, in, is a d-dimensional uh, real-valued vector and uh, the size of our vocabulary is 100,000, uh, what are the dimensions of B, this bias vector in this expression? 100,000, very good, okay. And what about W? 100,000 times D, very good, okay, yes. Um, although I guess if you write in TensorFlow, it's, you know, they use row vectors for some reason, so it's the other way around. Um, anyway, very good, yes, um, good. Okay, so now another way of thinking about uh, recurrent neural network language models is in terms of them as generative processes. So there's this funny duality, or not funny, but very important and profound duality between generation and probabilistic modeling. So we can run these things as a generator of text. So we can start um, with, as we always do, H0, and with language models, we always start with a special start symbol. We assume that every sentence or every sequence that we're gonna model has a distinguished uh, starting event, um, and we're going to embed that, and we're gonna compute uh, our H1 here. We're now going to project this out, compute a probability distribution over the entire vocabulary using that H1, and now we are going to sample from this probability distribution. And we might say sample the word Tom. And what is the probability of Tom? Well, it's going to be whatever the Tom cell of that, uh, of that vector, uh, whatever it contains. Um, and now we're going to take the word that we've just sampled and we're going to embed it. And we're going to now compute the hidden value H2 and the softmax. So can somebody tell me why intuitively we are connecting this thing that we've uh, just sampled, this word Tom, into the next, uh, it, feeding that into the, the RNN in this way. Why didn't we feed, say, P1 uh, into the recurrent net, uh, neural network at the next time step? I mean, that's got more information. That tells you uh, everything that could have happened, right? Yeah. So the um, letters are all the letters, so it's a mixture of extra mixtures. The network would not know about it, so it would be the very random. Yes. That's, very, that's a very good way of, of putting it. So the ran, there's this external random process. So the world goes and samples from this distribution, and we don't actually know something very, the model might know, say, English, but suddenly when reading a book, you might encounter a very unusual word because you're, say, reading a, you know, a guidebook about Lisbon, and you read this word Gulbenkian, and it's like, what is that? And uh, you have, it doesn't mean, uh, you don't want to know what might happen or all the things that might happen. You want to know what actually did happen, and this is extremely important. Um, and uh, if you don't make this connection, there's a, a really interesting thing that happens. Uh, you basically end up with an estimate of uh, a, it's the, the probability distribution gets very close to that of a unigram uh, language model. Although it's actually a little bit better than a unigram language model because that RNN that's ticking along there, you do remember how many words have elapsed. So when you go to sample the next word, all the RNN knows is like, oh, I'm in the fourth position. Is there anything statistically special about the fourth word in a sentence? And not really, language doesn't really have positional dependencies like that, but uh, it has a few. There are different words in the first and, say, second position uh, of a sentence. So all the RNN knows, if you don't feed that in, is what position in the sentence you're in. Um, so it's kind of, a, kind of an interesting problem to, to think about. But this is, this is very subtle. It's very easy to, uh, to get this wrong. Um, but, uh, like, well, the toolkits make it easy to not get this wrong, but, to, but thinking about this is important. Okay, so we can continue this. We keep uh, repeating the process. We get a probability. We get a word. Um, and then eventually we sample the stop symbol. Uh, and that says, uh, 
terminate the process, uh, return the sentence. So here, we've now generated the sentence, Tom likes beer, um, and stopped, and uh, the probability assigned by this model was computed as follows. Um, so, you know, one of the nice things about RNNs is that the uh, probabilistic decomposition uh, and the, uh, s the recurrent state uh, construction happen in, uh, in tandem. So you could imagine that every time we needed to compute a new uh, embedding of the history, we needed to rerun uh, over uh, the entire sequence, uh, say an RNN or something else, um, and that would be um, uh, more expensive. It would be qu a quadratic runtime in the length of the, the, the sentence. Um, so we don't want that. So here we're using, we're caching the previous value and using it to compute the next one. So this is actually an instance of dynamic programming, although most people don't talk about it. Uh, in that way. So how do we train uh, these recurrent neural network uh, language models? Well, we've got a probabilistic model, so we usually turn to various uh, statistical estimation techniques. Uh, maximum likelihood estimation is the, uh, the one we, uh, we usually like. So we assume we've got a corpus of data. So now uh, let's, rather than assuming that we have sampled this from this uh, random uh, generation process, let's assume that the universe has provided us with the sequence Tom likes beer. Um, so now, instead of seeing those things uh, as unshaded, we've, we've observed these things. Uh, so they're shaded uh, random variables. Um, and instead of now sampling them, what we're going to do is we're going to compute a cost that looks at what is the cost of generating this word given this probability distribution. And uh, there are actually a number of different uh, uh, criteria you can use to define this cost. The, uh, by far the standard one is uh, the log loss or the cross entropy where you say what is the uh, negative log probability assigned to this word in this position. Uh, and then we're just going to aggregate these as we always do because every word is equally, uh, equally important. Uh, and then we will uh, backpropagate uh, just like we did uh, when training uh, RNNs uh, in general. Um, and this is, um, this is language modeling uh, in a nutshell. This is how, uh, how these, these things are, uh, are all trained now. Um, so, the cross-entropy objective seeks the maximum likelihood uh, parameters for, for this model. So, effectively, you're finding the parameters that make the training data uh, most likely. Um, and uh, I will stop here to say that you are going to overfit when you do this, and you have to immediately from day one worry about how to deal with this fact. Um, so, uh, I will recommend three standard techniques here. Um, uh, one is uh, you should stop training early based on a validation set. So these things are not just uh, there, you know, if you want to sort of, uh, you, you aren't doing this just for sort of formal, to be formally correct. You're doing this because if you don't stop early, your, your model is actually not going to work uh, uh, as well as it could. Um, second, you should use uh, weight decay or other regularizers on the uh, parameters of your model. Uh, these things help uh, maybe a little bit less than some things. Um, and then dropout uh, uh, variants during training have also uh, been uh, extremely effective. Um, it's, it was originally the case, and if you read some papers even from just a year or two ago, uh, you'll find claims that, you know, dropout is somewhat controversial in recurrent neural networks, but uh, um, we have now conclusively proved that it is quite helpful and there are some techniques that are specialized uh, uh, for, for dropout. Uh, so, so you absolutely should uh, use these things uh, to train uh, your, uh, your recurrent neural networks. And um, so the one thing, uh, for those of you who think sort of more broadly about this, if you look at traditional problems of statistical estimation of uh, language models, there's this big problem of saying, well, you know, language models tend to assign zero probability uh, to things that they've never seen before in training. So one of the really nice things about neural networks is they, they're, because of the form of the softmax, they don't assign zeros to anything, so it's really not a problem. Uh, but overfitting uh, absolutely is. So uh, do, uh, do take care uh, from, from day one about checking your, your overfitting. 
Um, OK, so uh, let's summarize. So unlike Markov or n-gram language models, RNNs never forget. Um, however, right after this, we're going to see that uh, they do sometimes have trouble learning to use their memories. Um, so, uh, um, and we're going to, we showed a simple algorithm for sampling uh, a sequence from the probability distribution uh, defined by an RNN. That was just the simulation we just ran. Um, we can see that we can train the RNN to minimize cross entropy, which is also known as the maximum likelihood uh, estimator. Um, and I want to leave this with you here, just to have in the back of your head. We're going to come back to it uh, later on. Um, what if you wanted to find the most probable sequence of words uh, in, uh, in a model? Um, that's uh, actually a subtly difficult problem. But let me stop here and ask, are there questions about where things are? Yes. Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, t in order for a operation to be differentiable, uh, or at least, uh, we often don't require strict differentiability. We just require that a function be uh, continuous um, and have at least uh, subderivatives available, which are just sort of a generalization that let you deal with kind of uh, corners like this, which traditionally. Uh, we haven't, uh, we haven't dealt with. We basically say anything that like, lies under one of these corners counts as a subderivative. Um, so we, we can deal with. But if you have a function that um, changes direction suddenly, or there's a discontinuity there, what that means is that when you are, um, when you are, uh, trying to backpropagate. You're trying to compute if you had made a small change uh, in, in the inputs, what would the change in the outputs be? How, how, how do the, the two changes correlate? So it's really, it's the, you know, you can think of gradients as these, uh, as these correlations. So the reason sampling doesn't have, uh, doesn't have this smooth change is because every time you run the sampling operation, you compute something different. Um, so you, uh, there's no sense in which that, that's a coherent, uh, a coherent concept. So um, if you find yourself needing to, wanting to sample um, by, uh, or wanting to backpropagate through um, a, a sampling step, um, you probably want to think a little bit uh, differently about what, you, what it is you're, you're trying to do. And often then what you want to do is consider concurrently all of the possible outcomes uh, that might have happened and what you would do, uh, what, what you would do instead. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have, um, we can talk offline about some of, the, some of the more technical details here. One thing I will point out is that in this, uh, you can also think about these observable nodes here as blocking uh, the backpropagation that we would want to that we would want to do there. So one of the interest so uh, graphical models are another I interesting way of reasoning about uh, large families of uh, uh, of uh, models in a in a consistent way. And one of the uh, uh, important uh, insights that this gives you is that when you observe uh, data, it creates independencies between things that uh, happen. So when we're backpropagating in this, uh, in this computation graph, the parts that are, uh, that are uh, deterministic and, uh, and not shaded here, you know, and we get down to x2, we don't actually need to backpropagate beyond, uh, beyond Tom. That's just, uh, say, from uh, x2 t through Tom. Uh, that's, uh, that's just fixed. Um, so, um, that step is, uh, um, is blocked by the probabilistic semantics. The universe has told you this, this happened. We can't actually change what the universe did uh, in any way. We're interested in fitting what the universe did, so therefore it doesn't make sense to backpropagate through it. Um, does, that, does that help? Okay.
It, well, it certainly is. So, so um, I will say, imagine we uh, wanted a different generative process where uh, our language model worked as follows. So we took H1 and we used this to compute a parameter of, say, a Gaussian distribution, so a mean, and then we sampled from that Gaussian distribution, and then we added that to HT, and that became HT plus 1. Now, that's a perfectly reasonable model. And to train that, so the network that takes HT minus 1 and produces that mu that you need to sample for, to use to sample from, we want to train that model. It makes sense to back prop, to, it makes sense to want to train those parameters. But you have to be careful, you can't just, if you sample from a probability distribution, sampling itself is not a differentiable operation for the reasons that I said. So you need to think about a different way of training it. And the traditional answer that we've seen is, well, you consider all of the things that might have happened and you train based on the expected value uh, of, what, uh, of what the result is. There, there's also another trick where uh, called reparameterization, where you uh, the, stoch the stochasticity doesn't have any differentiable parameters. It's just a constant noise source, but you're effectively creating the samples uh, from this other distribution, and uh, uh, everything else is deterministic and uh, differentiable. So it is. It's not inconsistent to want to uh, learn things about probability distributions, but it is still not uh, very, it's, it's a bit hard to understand what uh, it means to sample, uh, to backpropagate through sampling, because backpropagation just means computing derivatives, and derivatives have these requirements where, you know, if, if it's a non, uh, if it doesn't give you the same result, um, it's not really, the derivatives aren't well defined, so backpropagation is gonna work. So you have to resort to other techniques. Okay, good, very good question. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, so, so let me say it back so uh, people can hear. Okay, uh, maybe. Uh, so, in this uh, in this sampling, we have this. Uh, probability, so we want to sample it. So is there any uh, better way of sampling? From uh, so one of the, th this, is a, this algorithm is actually called ancestral sampling, um, and because of the assumption of the model where we uh, always have a fixed past and then, cons and then define probability distributions over the next uh, word, um, in this case, these actually generate perfect samples from this uh, distribution that's defined by the RNN language model. Um, so this is, uh, and they're samples that have uh, random lengths uh, distributed according to the length of the model, and it's uh, linear in this length. So it's hard to imagine how you would end up with a sublinear uh, sampling time, so I don't really see that it would be possible to get something faster. Um, and since the samples are perfect, uh, you can um, you can like you can't improve on the uh, you're not getting any biases in there so it seems that you've got uh, optimal efficiency in terms of uh, uh, speed and also optimal efficiency in terms of statistics um, so it's pretty close to optimal now the operation of taking a so one of these probability distributions that comes out of your softmax and sampling from that. Um, there are a bunch of really clever algorithms for doing that step, um, and some of them are, are very fast. Um, they're, they're actually, uh, you can actually sample from such a distribution in constant time um, using a, a technique called alias sampling, which is one of the like, coolest algorithms ever. But unfortunately, the pre-processing that you need to compute the alias tables to do that constant time algorithm uh, requires uh, a linear amount of computation. So uh, in the number of words in your vocabulary, so you can't actually use that uh, because every time we sample something, we have to create a new probability distribution. Um, so I don't know very much about like what the state of the art is and uh, beyond that in, uh, in kind of if you just very quickly want to sample from a uh, probability distribution. Um, I do suspect that, uh, so one thing we know about language uh, is 
it's uh, very heavy tailed. So uh, uh, we have very often a few words that have very high probability and a very long tail of, of everything else. So if you organize your softmax such that the words you're likely to sample from are sort of early um, in the uh, early, then you maybe don't have to, uh, the sampling operation might get marginally faster, but uh, it's, it's pretty close to optimal is the answer. Good question. Okay, just on, on top of that, so for example, we are multiplying the probability series that we found, but for me, they seem like they are dependent on each other because we are taking some sample of from the first H to zero to H to one. So why are we multiplying the probabilities here? Ah, uh, yes. So you want to know? Well, so what we the reason we're multiplying the probabilities uh, here is because we want to know this. This comes from just the chain rule that tells us why the pro the probabilities uh, multiply. So th these were trained uh, so that they would basically have this probabilistic semantics. And the reason we did that is because the chain rule says you can decompose any uh, any ensemble of random variables. So we say all four words of the sentence are, are random variables and they interact jointly. We use the uh, chain rule to decompose uh, that. And that just says you multiply them. That's a, that's a probabilistic identity that follows from the uh, definitions of conditional probability. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, we'll have more time uh, at the break and uh, afterwards to, to talk about this stuff. But let's uh, let's go on so we don't uh, run out of time. Um, okay. So um, uh, we have some training challenges when uh, when training uh, neural networks, and I want to uh, I want to ha have you look uh, specifically at what happens. Say this is a a, um, a language modeling problem, and we want to predict the fifth word. Um, given this, uh, given the sentence, and what we want to know is what uh, is the derivative of, uh, and, and let's let's imagine we're modeling language, and we're predicting now the last uh, word in the sentence. So the, the say sentence final punctuation, question mark or period, and we want to uh, update the representations of all of the inputs and all the parameters so that we make a better decision. Say we predicted it quite badly, um, and so. Um, we know in this case uh, that things from the distant past at the beginning of the sequence might have strong bearing on what happens uh, later on. So let's look at, say, what happens if we want to compute the derivative of f with respect to h1, because you know eventually we're going to use that to compute uh, the derivative with respect to x. That's going to be the change to the word embedding uh, x. So, okay, let's just uh, follow, let's run back propagation on the slide. So we're going to start by differentiating f with itself. Then we're going to multiply this by uh, this Jacobian, the derivative of f with respect to, uh, to the prediction uh, y, uh, then the uh, derivative of y with respect to h4, um, and h4 uh, to h3 h3 to h2, h2 to h1, um, and then that will find, and then when we multiply all of this stuff uh, together, we get the derivative of f with respect uh, to h1. So this is just, uh, you know, calculus uh, 101. Um, so the thing to note here is that there's this um, chain of derivatives where we're di differentiating ht with respect to ht minus 1, um, and in this case, we run it from 2 to 4 because we, uh, you know, have a very short sequence here. But if we wanted to model sequences of arbitrary length, that the number of uh, these products that we're going to be multiplying together here is going to grow and grow and grow, right? Um, and so let's, let's stop. So we can, we can write this uh, in a slightly more generic way uh, as follows. So we can say if we want to find the derivative uh, of the loss at the last position with respect to uh, h1, uh, we have this, uh, this product here that is basically the, the length, has the number of terms that's the length uh, of the sequence in it. Uh, so um, let's write this a little bit differently. So up top, we've got this uh, complex thing uh, in the middle, this vxt plus hu minus 1, ut minus 1 plus c. Let's call that vector that gets computed zt. So we can now write what's happening inside of this product as we're first going to differentiate ht with respect to zt, 
And then we're going to differentiate ZT with respect to, uh, to HT minus 1. So we can move that up there. Um, so, okay, first, what's the derivative of HT with respect to ZT? Well, this is just uh, a nonlinear, uh, element-wise nonlinear activation function. This is something like uh, tan H uh, um, or, or ReLU. Um, and uh, so the derivative of element-wise operations is always just a diagonal matrix with the derivatives of the element-wise uh, um, components. Um, so that's this diagonal thing. Um, and then here's a quick question. What's the derivative of ZT with respect to HT minus 1? You should be able to look on the slide and see that. It's you. Very good. Okay. You guys have know your linear algebra way better than I did when I was your age. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so the product of these two things then is therefore uh, this diagonal matrix uh, um, with the uh, derivatives of g uh, of this vector along the, um, along the diagonal times, uh, times u. Um, and uh, so we can, we can put that in there. Um, and now we can think, okay, so basically what we're doing is we've got this iteration where we're just taking, this is just some matrix here, right? Um, and uh, what happens when you multiply uh, a series of numbers uh, together? Well, there are, there are three cases. So, um, you know, it's, it's sort of like saying what happens if you multiply a number by itself many, many, many times? Well, um, in some cases, if the number is greater than one, uh, it, uh, it explodes and the values get bigger and bigger. Uh, if the number is less than one, as you multiply it by itself, uh, it very quickly goes exactly to zero. But if it's exactly one, it just stays at one forever, which is great. The same thing happens with, uh, with matrices, um, and instead of the, you know, you don't look at the value of the matrix, you look at its eigenvalue, um, and, the, and the thing, ha and, and this happens um, exactly. Now, of course, there is some temporal variance, so ZT does change at each time, uh, but the, uh, um, you know, you can, you, can approximate, uh, um, you can approximate that, and you'll still see basically that these three things happen. So you're either going to explode or you're going to uh, vanish almost always. And uh, in fact, this is what we see happening. So you'll have either divergent learning or you will more likely uh, than not, you'll see that uh, you just don't have very much sensitivity to things that happened a long time ago because you can't update the uh, earlier representations. So you don't learn very well. Okay, <clears throat> so yeah, so in practice, the spectral radius of U is small and gradients vanish. And this means long range dependencies are very difficult uh, to learn even though there's nothing, as we said, you know, if we make the representation size of H big enough, we can represent anything. So that means there's nothing in principle wrong with this model. It's just hard to learn with gradient descent. So this is one of the things where, you know, it's really important to understand sort of the difference between like the learnability of a model and what the model can do in, uh, in theory. And there's, there's often a big gap there. Um, so there are a bunch of solutions to this. So people have tried to use better optimizers. Um, so SGD and its variants are, are fine, but uh, you know, there are some fancier things you can do that try and, uh, uh, that try and take uh, better steps from very, very uh, small gradients. Um, you can try to do normalization to keep the gradients uh, stable across time, um, which isn't exactly mathematically well-founded. At least we don't have very good theory to explain it, but it seems to work sometimes. Um, sometimes you do uh, clever initialization so that you at least start with good spectra. So the idea is if you initialize U properly at the beginning, well, at the beginning at least, your gradients will flow well. Now, as U gets updated, yeah, those you know, bets are off. But you might start, that sort of good initial start might be enough that you learn everything you need to know right at the beginning. And then you, know, you just kind of fine tune once you can't really back propagate very far. Um, but I want to focus on a fourth method, which is uh, alternative parameterizations, uh, namely LSTMs and gated recurrent units, which try and improve the learning dynamics by changing the form of the RNN. And these have had a huge, uh, huge impact on the field. In fact, I'd say LSTMs are single-handedly the reason why people in uh, natural language processing 
uh, switch to uh, neural networks. They just learn very easily. They're very easy to get to work with just a, a few small tricks. Um, okay, and so the intuition is, um, so in that gradient, what we've got is this thing that multiplies at every time step. Multiplication is just badly behaved. So what we want is the Jacobian to be exactly, uh, we want the, it to have a spectral radius of exactly, uh, exactly one. And what is a function that has um, a uh, spectral radius of exactly one? Well, the identity function. So um, let's think of an alternative that would be, in principle, an extremely uh, learnable model where we would never have any exploding or vanishing gradients. So we're going to introduce an idea of, uh, of memory cells. So um, what if instead of uh, having the, the representation that, that we just had, we said that um, now instead of HT, we're going to have this, uh, we're going to have something called CT. And it is going to be computed as, C, the fun as CT minus 1 plus F of X. And F here is just going to, again, be some uh, transformation of the input. So we're going to get some power to, to transform things. Um, and now when we want to have uh, an HT, we're going to have some other nonlinear transformation of the contents of, uh, of CT. And this is going to be sort of the hidden state. So you can see, you know, this looks superficially like uh, an RNN. You can train this thing. Um, it uh, ends up with, um, um, you know, propagating information. And when you differentiate, crucially, you... Um, have this great property that the derivative of CT with respect to CT minus 1 is just the identity matrix. So when you're going through and you're sort of, and you're running back propagation along all of those along all of those CTs, um, you're going to have a big bunch of multiplications all by I. And when you multiply by I, it doesn't matter how many times you do it. You don't lose any information or explode. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful function. Um, but unfortunately, you know, what's, what's the problem with this, uh, with this model? Do you think this is going to be as expressive as, uh, as, the, uh, as the RNN? What's that? Yeah, it doesn't, uh, I mean, you're going to be able to, yeah, it's basically a bag of words. You don't know anything about the context when you, when you update the current representation uh, at a, um, at a time, so so you're just adding together things. So it's it's yes, it's it's the bag of words assumption, which is uh, which is not we know maybe the best uh, possible model. So here's one that's uh, slightly better. What if when we update CT, we don't just look at x uh, at xt, we also look at the previous. Uh, at the previous uh, content of the RNN. This suddenly starts being, you know, quite a bit more interesting. Now when we figure out how we want to update these things, uh, it, uh, it, gets, um, it gets better. Um, now here, what are the derivatives? Well, it's uh, what I would say almost constant. So we have two paths when we go from C2 uh, to C1. So here, we've still got this wonderful identity thing that's, uh, that's going to be in there. But then we've also got the secondary path uh, that lets us go back through here. So C2 has two ways of getting to C1. And we have to, of course, sum uh, both of those uh, when we're computing the, uh, computing the gradients. So this turns out to be uh, almost constant. Um, and this is, uh, this is a little bit better. Um, now, the problem uh, with this is Sort of once something gets added into CT, uh, it's kind of there forever. Um, there's no way to, you sort of, in some sense, are, you know, forgetting is an important uh, aspect of, uh, uh, of human cognition. If we remembered everything that ever happened to us, we would lose the ability to adapt to new information. And certain things just are only transiently important, and we have no way of, of modeling this. So, so if you train this model, what you find is you don't have exploding gradients, but you have exploding values of C, um, which is just as bad. So um, how, can we, how can we deal with this? Um, so the next uh, innovation is to uh, introduce what's called a forget gate uh, and an input gate. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we've got this little 
for get gate, ft. So at every time step, what we're going to do is we're going to compute uh, a vector of uh, values that's the size of the memory cell. And that sigma is just the sigmoid uh, nonlinearity. So it's going to have values between 0 and 1. And what those uh, are going to be able to do is down, and, and this uh, circle with the dot in it, that's uh, the element-wise multiplication. So we're going to take a vector between 0 and 1 and multiply it by our memory cell. And this is going to enable us, in certain times, to zero out things, and at other times, just propagate them forward. We're not going to be able to rescale them arbitrarily. We're just going to be able to gate them on and off, um, or you know, maybe sort of half turn them off if we want. Um, and uh, so, and crucially, the value of the forget gate is going to be a function of ht at the previous time step and the current input. So we're basically going to say, OK, ht is a summary of what is, what's living in the memory cell at that time. xt is the current input. If you know what's in your memory and you know what the current input is, you've probably got enough information to reason about, well, should I forget some things or not? So that's the intuition for that formulation of the, uh, of the forget gate. The second innovation is uh, what's called uh, an input gate, uh, which basically says, I'm not going to, everything that I see at x at time step t is perhaps not relevant for updating my memories. I, wanna not, I, wa I don't want to remember everything. I just want to remember certain things. And so the input gate does exactly the same thing. It says, OK, what context am I in? Am I in a context where I need to remember a lot of things? Or am I, in a, am I in a context where, you know what, I can tell it's just not important. Like, it's the last day of the work of the summer school. You're like, I can snooze. Like, it just doesn't matter. Your, your input gate is turned way down. Um, I hope yours isn't. But the, um, <laughs> Like, uh, so, so that, that's the idea. Um, and then you also look at the input, of course, and say, well, does this look like something that I uh, should, be, uh, should be paying attention to? So you've got the information you need to know whether it, uh, you should be uh, adding this stuff. So um, basically, the pair of input and forget gates basically say, well, how much should I forget? How much of the past doesn't matter anymore? And how much of the new stuff that I'm seeing is important to be uh, put into my put into my memory cell. Um, okay, so yes. So we look the re that's a good that's a good question. This is a this is a subtle point. So we look at H T minus one. So we look at the previous thing. So H T minus one basically uh, summarizes the uh, the contents of the of the memory cell. You can actually implement this where you look at CT minus 1 directly, but um, I'm uh, deriving LSTMs here, so <laughs> um, I, wanna, I wanted to look at this one. Um, so uh, ba the intuition is that depending on the context you're in, uh, it will tell you whether it's very important to pay attention to something. So if I say, you know, remember the next random word, the. It's not a very memorable word on its own, but because of the context you were in, it was important to remember, uh, to remember that word. So uh, at the end, there will be a, a quiz on what the random word was. Um, but uh, so that, that's roughly the intuition for why, even when you're, when you're trying to make a decision about what, whether to uh, input things and also whether to forget things, you're looking also at the previous time step. Um, OK, so we've almost now got LSTMs. In fact, we have to make just one small change to get an LSTM. Uh, all we need to do is now add what's, uh, what an, out, uh, an output gate. So here, when we compute HT, rather than just taking this nonlinear transform of the, of the memory contents, we're going to say, you know what? At certain time points, uh, it's just not important to grant access to our memory. We can say, uh, you know, the, the outside world, uh, the, whatever problem we're computing, uh, doesn't, doesn't need access to this. So we're going to have yet one more gate uh, that's going to uh, look at the uh, previous time step, the current input, and say, uh, do I actually want to uh, depend on my memory when, uh, when I compute uh, my function? And so that, uh, that then just is used to gate the uh, output. 
uh, here. I find uh, the output gate to be the most mysterious one. Um, it does matter if you take it out. For most problems, uh, things get uh, quite a bit worse. Um, and, uh, but at any rate, uh, you can sort of see how each of these things, we started from this idea that we want to just have additive updates to our, uh, to our memories, which have this be these beautiful derivatives, and then we made minor adjustments to them uh, as we went along. And in fact, you do see that learning with LSTMs uh, is, uh, is much, much faster and uh, more reliable than, than regular RNNs. Um, one thing I will also say is there have been some claims that if you carefully initialize and carefully train RNNs, it really can, they can do as well uh, as LSTMs. Um, I will say as someone who's had the luxury of being able to uh, work in a company where um, I can run, you know, thousands of GPU jobs at once and, uh, you know, just hope that one of them has a good initialization, you can do well. Um, so maybe in that situation, RNNs work well. I was also at a university where I had like, you know, three GPUs for, for many years. And uh, LSTMs are reliable. It's much, you don't have to hope that they're, if, if there's a learning signal, they'll find it. Whereas RNNs, you have to, you have to work harder. So um, all of this is, uh, uh, is important in keeping in mind, um, not, it's, there's a big difference between what things can do in theory and what they do in practice. And LSTMs are a, a pretty good practical uh, solution. Um, so I want to talk very briefly about uh, LSTM variant um, that I really like. Uh, one is to use these coupled uh, input and, uh, and forget gates. Uh, so you basically just say um, anything that you forget you have to replace by a new memory. So you basically say that the input and forget gates have to uh, sum to one. This gives you a few fewer parameters. Um, if you have a lot of data, this is probably a little bit worse. It makes uh, uh, learning more successful uh, on, smaller, uh, on smaller problems. Yes? Yeah. Uh, yes, we, we, yes, a uh, very, very good question. Um, so one of the standard tricks that uh, people do here uh, is they, um, so if you look at what the derivative with respect to the forget gate is, it basically says like if there is uh, something on the other side of it that would be useful, it has pressure to increase the value of the forget gate. And then what happens is the forget gate then passes the information through in both directions. So it goes, it means the information gets carried forward in time, which is the thing you want to learn. And it means the gradients flow back unimpededly uh, back in time. Um, and so uh, it is, it is, it is a, in fact, the case that we are now guaranteed at every time step to be multiplying this forget gate when we're computing this, uh, when we're computing our gradients. But in fact, uh, they do tend to saturate fairly quickly. Uh, so we keep them, we do keep them exactly at one. Um, that's one of the great things about uh, sigmoids. And it's one of the things I've only recently sort of come to really appreciate is that by choosing nonlinearities who have saturation points where you actually want to hit the saturation point, you actually can, uh, you actually have a very powerful tool at your disposal for incorporating bias. Uh, into these, uh, into these models. Um, but it is, so it is true that we have still this multiplication on there, but in practice, uh, uh, it, it, it still learns uh, quite effectively. Um, the other thing that people often do, um, actually somewhat surprising, I suppose, given this, they initialize the forget gate to be biased towards to be, to be closed. So at the beginning of learning, you actually, the assumption is that your context, your memory, is going to be full of nonsense because you haven't learned to code your memories right. Um, and then once learning has progressed and you've got sort of a good mapping from inputs to outputs sort of locally, then you can start learning longer range context. So a standard thing to do is actually to add, a, either bias the things so that uh, the forget gate at the beginning of learning is, is closer to one or to uh, even just add a little value uh, in at the beginning and then the forget gate has to subtract away from that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a, it, it, this, is a, this is a good point. Um, so um, let me just finish LSTMs. Uh, I just have like two more slides that show this graphically, um, and then we'll take our break uh, now. Um, 
because it's uh, coffee time. Um, so anyway, this is a beautiful figure due to uh, Chris Ola, um, who uh, draws some of the most beautiful figures in the world. Um, and uh, this is his view of an LSTM cell. So you've got up top, you've got this uh, CT, uh, the cell. Here at each time step, you've got the inputs, and then you've got uh, <coughs> these uh, operations. So the little Xs are element-wise multiplications. Addition is addition. Uh, and then the arrows are, uh, are like matrix multiplies. So if you chain these things together, basically you can see what's happening is that at every time step, what you've got is this operation that says, so your memories are going along the top here. And at every time step, you've got the first operation says, well, I'm going to forget some of the past. And the thing that I'm going to use to forget some of the past depends on the current state of the machine and the current input. And then I'm going to make some new memories here in the middle. And then I'm going to add those together uh, here up top. So at every time step, you're doing two things. You're forgetting a little bit, and you're adding a little bit in. And this seems like a sort of general purpose learning machine, right? Um, so this is, uh, this is quite nice. So let's take a break here. Um, uh, we can uh, start with questions afterwards, but I don't want you to miss your coffee. All right, everybody, uh, let's, uh, let's get started. Um, OK, so we uh, just had gone through, uh, through LSTMs. Uh, I want to finish up with uh, gated recurrent units, uh, which are an uh, alternative to, uh, uh, to LSTMs. And they were actually invented by uh, Kang Young Cho, who is uh, this evening's uh, speaker. So uh, um, you know, if you love this stuff, stick around. I'm sure he's going to talk about different stuff. Um, these are an alternative to LSTMs that uh, require a little less computation to uh, update the hidden cells, um, but uh, in many cases do uh, work uh, about as well. Um, so basically, uh, what they do is uh, you'll notice that HT uh, is still this, uh, has this additive component where we uh, add, uh, rather than multiplying uh, of, uh, anything by the previous value of HT other than this kind of forget gate type thing, uh, we add to it uh, an updated quantity, this uh, H tilde T, which is kind of a, uh, which is just the uh, combination of the current input and uh, a gated version of, uh, of the previous uh, time, uh, time step. Um, and so, um, uh, yeah, you can see, uh, I, I don't want to dwell on the equations. We spent a lot of time on LSTM, so I think we should, uh, uh, we should go on. But, uh, uh, but the crucial thing is this addition, uh, this additive update in the middle uh, from going from HT minus 1 uh, to HT, um, which is the thing that gives us uh, uh, better, better gradient flow uh, during, uh, during learning. Um, so let me just summarize these variants of, uh, of RNNs. So we have, uh, we've got these three things. So one, uh, classic recurrent neural networks, which I should give credit, this is due to, uh, uh, to, to Elman, um, uh, who uh, you know, invented these things in the early 90s. Uh, in fact, two model language. Uh, this was during a, uh, the early years when uh, uh, neural nets weren't, people weren't really excited about them because of their ability to uh, uh, maybe solve AI or to let computers do things humans could do, but because they were a serious uh, contender for explaining human cognition. Uh, and so the, the linguists came to him and said, well, yes, how are you going to account for all of these things we see in language? And Elman came up with uh, that first line there. Um, uh, then we have, uh, a few years later, Schmidt Huber coming up with uh, this notion of a memory cell that could be uh, that could things could be forgotten from and then updated at each time step with the input and forget gates, um, and then we have gated recurrent units, which are a kind of optimized version uh, of LSTMs. Um, so crucially, uh, the big improvements, the things that really distinguish LSTMs and GRUs from uh, RNNs, is this notion um, of uh, additive recurrent dynamics rather than multiplicative ones. And uh, obviously, in order to uh, get the uh, context sensitivity when you're processing new inputs, you have, to, uh, you have to pair up XT and HT in various ways. They do that inside of the gates in, uh, in LSTMs, um, and, uh, uh, and also when computing the update, this uh, 
uh, this last term in the GRU, uh, in, uh, uh, in GRUs, um, but uh, that, that's surmountable. But uh, it does, in general, make uh, um, learning much, much easier. Um, so I would say uh, I'll end this section by saying uh, that recurrent architectures are an active area of uh, research. Um, I presented a very mathematical analysis of the problem and the solution. Um, and uh, that was very much how Schmidt Huber was, uh, was thinking about these things. Uh, but it d requires more than just that. You need to have a, a knowledge of mathematical analysis, but also come up with creativity. Um, and also problem spe specific uh, uh, knowledge is, uh, is extremely uh, uh, important in these, in these cases. Understanding the nature of the learning problems that you're facing is, uh, um, is extremely helpful. And we're going to see in just a little while uh, an example where people understood uh, a problem, uh, uh, some details about the problem they're trying to model, and this gave rise to a new architecture that worked um, very well. Um, I also haven't covered everything in the space. There are uh, some wonderful new innovations in the last year uh, using convolutions instead of uh, uh, recurrent neural networks to uh, uh, to build this uh, summary statistic is extremely important. I'll just say very quickly, the one trick you've got to do there is in a generative model, you can't condition on the future, obviously. You have to have a properly causal model. Uh, and so uh, you have to use what's called a masked or causal convolution uh, when doing this. Uh, some people, especially people who are interested in training on truly vast amounts of data or very long sequences, very much like convolutions because they uh, can be implemented more quickly uh, in hardware than, uh, than LSTMs can. Um, a second one that uh, is, uh, is extremely uh, interesting is um, uh, based on uh, the attention mechanism that we're going to see a little bit later on. But um, feel free to talk with me uh, afterwards if you, if you have questions about any of this stuff. Um, so um, let's just stop here. Uh, some of you came up during the break and asked questions, but does anyone else uh, have questions? And please ignore the part about the break because we're not actually going to have a break. OK, let's go on. OK, so here's our sort of touchstone that we're uh, visiting throughout this talk, this uh, unconditional language models problem. Um, so we, uh, you know, had this very complicated problem of modeling a sequence, which we reduced to just modeling one word and representing a sequence, which is nice. Um, and we solved this nicely with the RNNs. Now, in the second half of this lecture, we're going to focus on the conditional problem. So like an unconditional language model, a conditional language model generates a sequence of words. However, it's also going to have some additional conditioning context, which we're just going to call X. Um, X can be kind of anything. In fact, we'll see in the next slide uh, an example of it, of all the things X can be. Um, but uh, formally, we can uh, use the chain rule to decompose this just like we, um, just like we always did. Um, so the probability of the sequence of words is the product of the conditional probabilities of each word conditional on the previously generated words and the extra input X. So like with uh, unconditional language models, we reduce the modeling problem to modeling the distribution over the next word rather than over uh, to the problem of modeling, from the problem of modeling all sequences. Um, so um, what problems can we solve with conditional language models? Well, really anything that takes some input and produces some uh, text output. So uh, last night's lecture from, uh, from Sasha was, uh, was a wonderful example of, uh, of a bunch of these things. Um, and uh, uh, sort of, um, you can really, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface um, of, of what's possible here. Um, I do want to say we need to be somewhat careful about the uh, data, though, for training conditional language models. Um, so we need paired samples in general. So we need X's paired with W's. And um, data availability varies. Uh, so um, it's very easy to think about tasks that could be solved quite easily by conditional language model, but the data doesn't just, that just doesn't exist. So dialogue is kind of a classic one that seems like you'd like to be able to, uh, you'd like to be able to solve with a conditional language model, but um, you don't have a lot of examples of, uh, of dialogues, especially if it's a, uh, say, goal-oriented dialogue and you're starting a new, 
uh, a company that's going to provide, say, you know, call center services, um, it, and, a, and a new customer comes along and they'd like you to build them a dialogue system. Well, there's just no data yet, and um, these uh, kinds of models often take uh, millions of, uh, of examples uh, before they really perform reliably well, um, and uh, that data just it's going to be very expensive to create and it's not going to exist. Now, relatively large amounts of data exist either because they're naturally occurring in the case of translation and summarization um, or because people have put in significant effort to creating this data, such as in the case of uh, caption generation um, and perhaps speech recognition. Um, people just saw the value in creating this data and so they, they've done it. Um, but it doesn't always, uh, doesn't always exist. Um, one thing I also want to bring up here, because I don't think we talk uh, enough about this in, you know, machine learning contexts. We we uh, tend to focus on the modeling stuff, but it's really important to be able to evaluate well uh, our models. And uh, evaluation isn't uh, sort of uh, uh, an easy problem. So um, I'd say, you know, for conditional language models, there are sort of three things we. Uh, um, we, we do. So the first is, so this is a language model. We assign probabilities to sequences. So we can use any of the standard probabilistic fit measures like uh, cross entropy or perplexity uh, to, uh, uh, to, to evaluate these things. Um, and, you know, this is an okay metric to, uh, uh, to implement. It's a little bit um, subtle to get it right. Um, it, you can easily like leak probability and then you sort of cheat yourself and cheat yourself compared to uh, uh, the systems you're comparing to. Um, and it's also quite hard to interpret. Like um, it has a nice kind of intuitive semantics in terms of information theory, but it doesn't really tell you very much about the task you're trying to solve. Um, there's also more task specific evaluations. Um, and these are, I think, in some you know way the nicest. So you compare the model's uh, most likely output to human-generated um, expected output using a task-specific uh, metric, L. Um, and, uh, you know, this involves making some decision like decoding from your model, say sampling uh, or choosing the most probable sequence of words given the input X, and then comparing that to a reference output generated uh, by a human. Um, so for tasks where there is only one or a small number of correct answers, uh, that reference set can be uh, sort of well, uh, well modeled and task specific evaluation is, uh, um, is pretty good. So for something like speech recognition, there, aren't, there isn't too much ambiguity in what you should write down. For something like translation, there's maybe a little more. Um, for something like what's the right caption for an image, like it's actually a really hard problem to evaluate automatically. Um, and then finally, there's human evaluation, which is um, uh, often treated as the, uh, uh, the gold standard. Um, I'm a little skeptical of, uh, uh, of human evaluation because uh, people are extremely varied and uh, the variance you get, to, uh, you get from people when uh, comparing them um, may be, um, it's not always better to have, um, like you can have two sources of uh, error, you can have bias or you can have variance. And so having very high variance uh, samples from people is actually maybe worse than just having a biased estimator uh, from a task specific evaluation metric. So in general, um, my uh, advice, uh, unless you, um, really uh, have to use humans is to stick with one of the uh, imperfect uh, task specific evaluations. Um, okay, so let's uh, move on now. Enough about the sort of evaluation stuff. Let's talk about modeling. So we're gonna start with a really simple class of models which are incredibly uh, useful for a whole variety of problems. So um, these are called encoder-decoder models and the basic idea is that uh, we're going to have an, an encoder which is going to take an input X and in, represent it by a fixed size vector. And of course, this is going to be uh, a neural network that's going to uh, do this and we're going to learn its parameters via, via backpropagation. Um, and then we're going to decode that X into a sequence of words. Um, and so we can do this uh, for, for machine translation. And uh, so those of you who were here last night for Sasha's talk will we'll have seen this, so I won't uh, belabor this point too much. 
Um, but you can also replace the encoder with, say, something that reads a sequence of, uh, of words, and you can represent this. Um, you could put, say, a ComNet that reads in images, and then you can train this to predict, uh, predict captions. And uh, this is um, a wonderful example of why neural nets are so, um, so exciting, is because we can, uh, we can work on just getting good uh, architectures for solving the decoding problem, uh, and then use them to solve a whole bunch of tasks or to improve a whole bunch of tasks, um, which, is, which is really a nice thing from an engineering perspective. Um, okay, so for dealing with encoder-decoder models, we have two questions. So first is how do we encode X as a fixed size vector C? Um, this is, of course, going to be very uh, problem um, or, or at least modality specific. Um, and uh, the second question is how do we condition on C uh, in, the, uh, in the decoder component. And this is uh, a lot less problem specific, um, and we're gonna review uh, a solution using uh, recurrent neural networks. Um, so uh, the first um, serious uh, encoder decoder model in, uh, um, uh, in the world is due to Kalkbrenner and, uh, and Blensum uh, 2013, uh, who used this for uh, machine translation. Uh, and so their encoder takes uh, an embedding function, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, and produces a vector C from X. Uh, and then they transform this with this extra uh, linear map V that's also learned. Um, and this representation is then used uh, as the input to uh, the decoder. Uh, for the decoder, they use a recurrent neural network that's been slightly modified. So um, here, what we've got is the recurrent uh, equation definition for computing HT. So this was sort of before LSTMs became very popular. They just used a standard Elman style RNN. And uh, you'll see uh, they combine the previous uh, hidden state, HT minus uh, one, an embedding of the previous uh, word, as we always uh, do in uh, uh, in language modeling. Uh, we have a bias and then we also add, we just add in uh, this representation of the source sentence S. Um, and then at every time step we project this out onto the target language vocabulary, take a softmax and that gives us the probability distribution uh, over the next uh, word uh, from which we can uh, say sample um, or we can compute across entropy with respect to uh, uh, training data. Um, and so it's you know, worthwhile comparing this to the unconditional language model. All that's different is we just have this plus s term in the, uh, in the language model there, and, um, or in the recurrent uh, uh, component there. And so it's a, a very, very minimal change. And you would think, wow, does this actually, uh, does this actually work? Um, so first, before we answer that question, let's look at the encoder that they used. So they, um, they tried a couple of different models, but they actually spent a lot of time working with, uh, with this model here, which just takes together the uh, embeddings of, of each word. So every word type is embedded as a vector, and then it just adds them together. So what do you think of this model? People are, yeah, so a little skeptical. So what's one of the problems that it's gonna have? Order, yeah, right? Addition is, uh, addition is commutative. So uh, this is probably not what you want in your uh, language isn't, so it's maybe not the right match, but uh, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, okay, so let's look now at how the, uh, how the model actually works of, uh, at the decoding part. So um, this looks, almost identical to the uh, previous model that we've seen. So we're, we're starting, we have the output of our encoder, which is this vector S. Um, we now start uh, feeding in sent, uh, symbols uh, in order to generate a translation. We start with our start symbol. We feed this in to get an embedding. We combine it with a, a special H naught uh, learned uh, uh, context or initial embedding, and then we use that to compute H1. The only difference from the regular RNN is that we also condition on S uh, when, when computing uh, the value of H1. This gets projected out uh, onto a uh, probability distribution over the, uh, um, the vocabulary in the target language from which we sample uh, a 
word. So this might give us Tom, for example. So we now, uh, uh, and if we look in the cell associated with Tom, that'll be the probability of Tom conditional on the start symbol and on this vector S, um, which encodes the, uh, pre the entire uh, input sentence. Uh, we'll then feed the word we've just sampled. Uh, we'll re-embed that, and we'll feed that into uh, the, um, the RNN. Again, we're going to condition directly on, on S. You might think that you wouldn't, once you've updated H1 with S, that you wouldn't need to continue to do this. Um, uh, again, uh, because this was sort of prior to the days of LSTMs, remember we have uh, this problem with gradient flow in RNNs, so you would have to remember everything about the source sentence uh, all the way through this long sequence, and by adding them in at each time point, you, you have this uh, direct gradient flow. So, so this you know, trick of adding in things that you want to uh, have good gradients for is, a, is just a trick you see over and over and over again uh, when designing uh, neural networks. Um, so, and that's what, they, that's what they do here. So now we sample um, the second word. Uh, and uh, we repeat this process again up until we uh, get to the end of the sentence. So if you have such a model, you can sample uh, translations. You can just keep uh, uh, flipping coins and uh, it will generate sequences that are roughly proportional to what it thinks the right uh, translation um, is. Now, however, we often don't want to randomly sample translations. We want to say, well, what's the best possible uh, translation given uh, this model. Um, so uh, th there was an interesting question at the break on this relationship between uh, LSTMs and what you're actually doing with uh, when you're reasoning uh, about probabilities. And LSTMs actually don't, uh, the modeling probabilities and using probabilities um, actually don't have very much to do with each other. So the field of decision theory is, the, is where you want to go if you want to say, how should I act under uncertainty? And there have been, there's been a lot of brilliant um, work uh, on this, but um, uh, it's this is not the decision theory summer school. I will just say that this is actually a, a very interesting uh, problem that uh, needs more attention. Um, but this is often uh, the decision rule that we use. So we want to find the most likely sequence W uh, given some uh, input X. Um, which we can rewrite uh, as follows. Um, for those of you who have taken a class on probabilistic inference, when you see this max followed by this sum, you should say, oh no, this is something that I you know, am worried about because inference gets hard then. Um, and in fact, this is a um, really hard problem. In fact, it turns out it's an undecidable problem with RNNs, um, which is um, kind of, uh, kind of a problem. Um, so we often approximate it with a greedy search. Um, and greedy search turns out to work really well in these uh, locally normalized left to right factored models uh, that, that we've been working with all day today. So the idea there is you just take the most probable word uh, for the first position and we choose that as our first word, then that is our sample. We feed that in as uh, uh, into the RNN and then choose the most likely word for the next position. Um, and we repeat this until we hopefully get to a stop symbol um, or we sort of run out of, we say, we set a maximum length. So that way the algorithm al always terminates. Um, so I'll leave it up to you to convince yourselves that this isn't going to find the globally optimal solution, um, that it's not guaranteed to. It often does, but it often doesn't. Um, and. Uh, Instead, uh, now we'll look at a slightly better uh, variant of this, uh, which is to use uh, beam search uh, for, uh, for decoding. Um, and perhaps by working through this, you'll see uh, some ways in which maybe the greedy algorithm doesn't work well. So the idea behind a beam search is rather than keeping track of just the very best uh, prefix translation, you keep track of a beam of promising ones, because you think, well, maybe, although this one translation is slightly better ahead, after I decode a few more words, I might actually, it might actually turn out to have a higher probability than the one that looked most promising um, originally from the start. So the way this, uh, this algorithm works is uh, you're going to start with uh, the start symbol, and you're going to uh, build H1, and then you're going to take the top B 
um, in this case, two um, translations. So here's my input sentence, Bier trinke ich. Um, means I drink beer in German. I've got a beer theme in this talk. Sorry for those of you who don't drink. Um, uh, and here are the top two uh, hypotheses that uh, uh, next words continuing uh, this S. So maybe I and beer. And each of these are going to be associated with a total log probability. So this log probability is the probability of everything that's happened up till then uh, in the hypothesis. Um, and now we're going to repeat this process. We're going to get the top two uh, hypotheses that continue each of these things. Um, and now suddenly we've got four hypotheses. And you can see if you repeat this process forever, we're going to you know, grow exponentially. And this is going to be a fairly expensive algorithm. Uh, it's, um, uh, so what can we do? Well, we're just going to, at each time, kill off all of the uh, things in the beam that are, uh, we're going to keep only the top B hypotheses. Uh, so in this case, the second one and the fourth one are the, are the winners. Um, it could have been uh, two from, uh, you know, one entire path could be killed off. It doesn't have to be um, sort of, they don't have to be located anywhere in particular uh, in the tree. Um, and then we'll just continue, uh, that we'll expand just those two. So this is a way of bounding the amount of work uh, that, we, um, that we have to do. Um, so finally, we get to the end, uh, and we can figure out which one. Um, so here we kill off then the two that didn't win. Um, and now let's say you know we get the next one is everything generates end of sentence symbol. Um, and now we just look at which one has the highest probability. Uh, well, in this case, it's uh, this uh, this path, so we can trace it back and recover the translation. I drink beer as uh, as our as our translation here. Um, so uh, beam search is a very useful uh, model, uh, or very useful decoding algorithm. Um, one of the surprising results uh, is that uh, as you get bi bigger and bigger beams, you're guaranteed to always get higher and higher probability uh, translations. Um, often, though, the translation quality doesn't uh, keep improving. Um, and there's a very interesting paper from uh, Facebook uh, AI research in, uh, in New York that just was put on archive uh, recently that looks at why this is. And uh, it actually discovers that uh, the model is picking up on some sort of strange aspects of the data and learning that some with fairly high probability, a good thing to do in translation is just to copy the input sentence to the output sentence. Um, and this is just because a lot of our training data is extracted automatically and quite noisy. Um, and so while this is a reasonable thing to do to fit that data, it's still a bad thing to do in translation. So um, it's often better to use a more um, uh, a smaller beam. So you should tune your beam sizes basically to do well uh, on translation quality. OK, um, so um, now let's go back to actually talk about how well uh, uh, Bluntsum and uh, Kalkbrenner and Bluntsum did at, uh, uh, with, with their fairly naive model. So um, they start with the sequence of, uh, um, of words in the input. Um, I uh, don't uh, speak Chinese, so I will be surprised as you with what comes out. Hopefully, it'll be good. Um, they're going to embed these things and add them together. This is a, the most naive possible uh, model. Um, so the uh, encoder just is the summation. Um, and then they're going to uh, run this recurrent neural network to uh, decode things uh, using just a greedy uh, decoder. Um, and what comes out is, may I have a wake-up call at 7 tomorrow morning? which is a pretty remarkable, uh, remarkably good translation, if you think about it. This is a, a very simple sentence, um, or a fairly, sorry, a very complex sentence, a remarkably co simple uh, encoder, um, and it still produces this, um, this nice sentence. Now, I will say that the data that this was trained on is uh, from a, a very circumscribed uh, tourist domain, so, um, it probably uh, doesn't have a lot of things to, once it gets roughly in the right part of the space, it can generate a reasonable sentence. Um, and so you can see things that it happily produces things, like where's the currency exchange office? Um, here's a nice one. I like to have a room under $30 a night. Um, in fact, I tried this one on Google Translate uh, last night, and it doesn't uh, actually translate uh, very nicely um, on that one. Um, but the model can, of course, um, 
go quite badly. So here's a sentence that literally means, I will feel bad if you don't find a solution. Um, and uh, you put this into this uh, uh, encoder decoder and what comes out is, I can't urinate. Um, which, uh, you know, is one of the big problems with uh, neural networks that we continue to uh, worry about is that when they go wrong, or when they go right, we don't know why. Um, we have we have trouble uh, we have trouble understanding that, um, and so a big uh, um, a big opportunity is to uh, come up with diagnostics that help us understand and reason about what these models um, are doing, even just trained models. And this can, of course, we hope help us uh, not only understand when they go wrong or why they go right, but help uh, come up with innovations that will hopefully help them do. Uh, better in the future. Um, and now I realize I actually have to switch to a different uh, slideshow. So um, my apologies um, while I while I do this. Okay, um, all right, so um, let's talk about problems with this, uh, with this model. So um, as you, you mentioned, this encoder is terrible. It's the worst possible uh, encoder. So we can't distinguish whether Alice saw Bob or Bob saw Alice, uh, um, and we can't decide whether we'd like some fresh bread with aged cheese or aged bread with fresh cheese. Um, uh, but. Uh, I guess that depends whether you're in Portugal or England. But, uh, um, <laughs> sorry, I can say that because I live in England. Um, <clears throat> uh, so basically, we're putting uh, the second problem is we're putting a lot of information uh, inside of a single vector, and sort of what fits into a vector is uh, a matter of some ongoing uh, curiosity, um, and uh, or I would say you know argument, vehement argument. Um, so we'll come back to uh, this. Um, later, but first we're going to address the problem with uh, part one. Um, and this happened a year later with uh, uh, the work of Ilya Suskiver and colleagues uh, from, from Google. Um, Ilya is now the uh, I guess CTO of uh, OpenAI. Um, and so the idea is that rather than using a bag of words or this, uh, this additive model of the input, we're going to use an LSTM. As we've seen, an LSTM can easily read uh, a sequence and summarize it into a single vector. That's exactly what we want to do in encoder-decoder models. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to run an LSTM. We're going to update the states uh, uh, with the standard LSTM rule. And then we're going to say that the encoding is just the uh, cell and hidden state pair uh, at the time step after we've read the last word uh, in the sentence. Um, and then we're going to, for our decoder, we're just going to continue to run the LSTM. Um, however, at this point, we're going to start taking those HTs that we're producing, and we're going to use those to define, pro we're going to project those out onto the target language, uh, language model, and we're going to use those to start generating uh, translations. Um, and so this is a, uh, basically a minimal change to the Kalkbrenner and Blunza model rather than using um, an RNN, uh, or rather than using a bag of words, we're going to use an RNN, and rather than using a Elman style RNN, we're going to use LSTMs. But everything else uh, stays uh, the same. And um, so, uh, so here's how here's how things work. So we read uh, things together uh, in an LSTM. This is slightly different uh, graphical uh, notation. Uh, made this for different slides, um, and then we're going to start. Uh, decoding uh, translations um, again until we produce the, uh, uh, produce the stop symbol. But uh, they actually use just one set of LSTM parameters, both for the encoder part and the decoder part. The only thing that's different are the embedding layers and, of course, whether you're doing a projection um, during, uh, uh, onto the target language vocabulary. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this is an incredibly simple model. Um, so what's good and bad about this? So, um, so first, RNNs deal naturally with sequences of various lengths. I mean, that's what we spent the first half of this lecture deriving why we, why we want that. Um, and so we might as well use them whenever we need to do this. 
Um, and in principle, at least, LSTMs can propagate gradients a really long distance. So um, they don't have to remember, or even though they have to remember, they have mechanisms to learn to remember. Um, and it's a really simple architecture. If you optimize your LSTM, if you get that really well implemented, like uh, you, you can just run it uh, on, on whatever data you've got. Um, now, the bad part about this, and we're going to come back to this later, is that the hidden state has to remember a lot of information. So um, what did Siskiyou et al. do to, uh, to make this better? Well, they introduced a few tricks. Um, so uh, one thing uh, that I think is very interesting is if they read the input sentence backwards and then decode, I mean, all they did was like literally flip the order of the words around. Um, they improved the performance of the model by uh, four blue. Um, and, uh, you know, I worked on MT for many years, and uh, uh, an improvement of four blue uh, at the time this came around was, you know, the kind of thing that just never, never came along. Now, they were still below the, the best uh, non neural systems uh, without this trick, but, um, you know, it was still showing that even small tweaks to neural networks could have, uh, could have massive. Uh, massive changes in performance. But what's really interesting about this is why this works. So if you think about uh, tr translation, so they were working on French-English translation. French and English have sentences that roughly put information in the same word order. So subjects come before verbs, uh, objects come after verbs, uh, that's r roughly the, and the verb is kind of in the middle. Um, both, that's true in both languages. Now. Adjectives and nouns maybe are a little bit different in English and, and German. A few other things move around. But basically, uh, the two languages have the same word order. Um, and so what this means is that in the standard uh, uh, direct uh, in-order translation, um, the average distance that gradients have to flow is roughly n, where n is, say, the length of the sentence. And we'll assume that n is sort of about the same for, for both source and target. Um, and when you reverse things, well, what this means is that you're going to be reading a word near the beginning of the sentence as the last thing the LSTM doing the encoding work does. And then you're almost immediately after it going to produce it as a translation. So the gradient doesn't have very far to, uh, to travel in order to learn how to generate the beginning of the sentence, which is very good. But then by the time you get to the end of the output sentence, you're generating something that comes from uh, quite early, uh, that the decoder read only very early on. So um, it's actually going to be something close to uh, a distance of 2n. So on average, the distance in both cases is going to be n. So at the beginning, it's like 1. At the end, it's 2n for the reversed case, whereas it's sort of a constant n throughout for the uh, for the non-reversed case. But for some reason, once it starts learning that, uh, that sort of close uh, distance, then it gets much, it's much easier for it to learn to generalize to the, to the more general case. And this has been observed with LSTMs uh, many times. Um, and uh, so, you know, coming, like, recognizing these sorts of things as tricks is, uh, is often uh, key to getting these models, uh, models to work. It's both sort of, um, exciting because it means there's an opportunity to fix problems, but it's also a little intimidating because it seems like you have to know this sort of not very theoretically well-grounded uh, um, set, of, set of tricks to, to use. Um, so another uh, thing that, uh, uh, which is more uh, theoretically well-grounded, very interesting, uh, that they found helped quite a lot is using an ensemble of J independently trained uh, models. Um, and so basically what they do is they trained uh, uh, independent LSTMs, just you know, with different random starting points, um, and they uh, ran these uh, in parallel both during uh, during decoding. And so, when they went to compute the uh, things that they were going to feed into the softmax, which we now sometimes call logits, um, these unnormalized probabilities, they just took the arithmetic average uh, of these things before passing them into the softmax. And uh, then that defined the probability distribution. And if you just do this with two models, you already get an improve, improvement of three. Uh, and if you do this with five models, it goes up 4.5 blue. Um, and this is very nice. Basically, what you're doing is you are uh, 
smoothing the uh, predictions made by the different models against each other. So they should all agree. This is a variance reduction strategy. So you have overfit in some sense to idiosyncratic facts of the uh, training data uh, in each of the models. And by averaging, you come to a lower variance uh, consensus. Um, and this is a useful, uh, a useful technique. And this can be done. Uh, this can be done in literally any neural network. Um, it's just a bit uh, computationally expensive because you're running a bunch of models in parallel. Um, so uh, beam search also uh, helped a little bit. So if they uh, if they added a beam, they got an improvement uh, of one blue. Um, I actually think this is nice because it really shows that we don't need to spend a lot of time uh, worrying about blue, um, uh, or we don't need to worry a lot about search. Um, so, uh, because before this, the models we did, search was a much harder problem. So the fact that beam search was uh, not terribly helpful uh, was nice. However, I will say, um, this is what I had uh, alluded to earlier, that uh, actually if you use too much, if your beams get too big, you can actually start uh, losing performance. And uh, if you, um, there's this other paper from, uh, 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 Philip Curran and uh, Courtney Knowles um, from last year that's uh, got some really interesting observations uh, about this that are that are worth having a look at. Um, okay, so uh, let's go on to the second uh, and arguably uh, more serious problem uh, with this uh, with this model. So we had solved the problem with uh, not ignoring word order information by getting rid of uh, this uh, uh, addition model in the encoder. Uh, but now we're still creating this bottleneck that all things have to, uh, to pass through. And um, this uh, has been critiqued uh, by, this is a um, professor at the University of Texas called Ray Mooney, who uh, um, was extremely uh, upset that anybody would think to, to do this, um, and especially that this should be sort of the uh, centerpiece of kind of natural language processing for the next, next decade. Um, and uh, he was right, um, so we quickly figured out that there are better things that uh, um, we can do. I mean, the big problem here is that gradients have a long way to travel, and even LSTMs forget. Um, so uh, let's, uh, let's look for an alternative. Um, so what we're going to do is rather than representing the source sentence with a single matrix, a single vector, we're going to represent it as a matrix. And then we're going to generate the target sentence uh, from, uh, from the matrix. And this is both going to solve the capacity problem, uh, but it's also, going, it's also going to solve the gradient flow problem. Um, so uh, the problem with the fixed size vector model is that sentences are of substantially different sizes, but vectors always have to be uh, the same size. And our solution is we're going to use a matrix where we're going to have a fixed number of rows, but the number of columns is going to be uh, dependent on the number of words in the sentence. And in fact, usually the number of columns is just going to be the length of the input sentence, which I'm going to call f in this part of the talk. Um, so we'll have things like this. We'll have a matrix that looks like this for the sort of medium-sized sentence. And for the short sentence, we'll have this narrower one. For a long sentence, we'll have, uh, we'll have a fatter one. Um, and then the question, of course, is how do we build these matrices? And this continues to be uh, a question that is, that is asked uh, continuously. Um, there were major innovations in the last few months uh, in how we uh, construct these, uh, these things. Um, so the simplest uh, way of representing uh, a, um, an input matrix is just to say, well, we've got word embeddings. Um, why don't we concatenate them uh, together? And uh, this is um, so simple that nobody actually, I think, has published how well this works. It's not going to work well. We can talk about why uh, some of the limitations that it has. Um, but uh, it would, it's, you know, everybody kind of runs it, nobody, but there isn't like a definitive answer for how well this works. Um, so this model looks like just this concatenation operation. Concatenation, of course, um, you know, is sort of trivially uh, differentiable. Um, and uh, so we end up with a matrix whose size is n by the number of words uh, in the sentence. Um, a much more uh, common technique, I think probably still the, uh, the dominant uh, approach um, and the one I, I most strongly uh, advocate, 
uh, is to use bidirectional uh, recurrent neural networks. And I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about this because bidirectional recurrent neural networks are sort of the most, one of the most useful strategies for building representations, particularly at the sentence level. Um, so sentences are not too long that, the, that it's sort of overly arduous to compute uh, a, a whole sequence um, of RNN activations. Uh, they're also small enough that gradients can kind of flow around, so you tend to learn uh, well um, at, at this size. Um, but by having a bidirectional RNN, that basically means you read both, uh, you read the words from left to right in one, uh, in one uh, RNN, and you read the words from right to left in a second RNN with different parameters, and then you synchronize on the hidden states, so you get an embedding of uh, so each word has a forward representation representing the left context and that word, and then a backward representation which contains that word and its following context. Um, and so you, in some sense, have a representation of uh, a word in the context of a complete sentence, no matter how long the sentence is. And so if you think back to the old days when we used to worry about problems like word sense disambiguation and natural language processing, uh, and we thought, well, gosh, we need to, say, you know, if we say something, if we see uh, a word like plant, we need to, dis maybe we should distinguish whether we're talking about the green growing thing or the thing down the street that makes uh, cars, and we should figure out what the inventory of senses are and everything like that. And that was a very hard problem. There wasn't a lot of data. But when people did start building models to do this, they found that the way you solve this problem was by looking at the context words occurs in, where uh, that these words occur in, and that gives you the information you need to solve the word sense disambiguation problem. So in some sense, what we've done here is we're, capture, we're enabling these models to use uh, context to maybe do some sense uh, disambiguation, which I think is um, important. Now, the implementation is uh, uh, often done with either GRUs or LSTMs. Um, the original paper uh, due to uh, Dimitri Badnau and colleagues at uh, Montreal uh, used, uh, used GRUs, but uh, LSTMs tend to work uh, maybe a little bit better uh, for this. So basically, what we're going to do here is we're going to run <coughs> these, and we're going to get these right arrow Hs. We're going to take the same uh, embeddings and run them backwards. Um, you can stack this a couple of times and, and get deeper. Um, so you can take the H's at uh, each time step and now feed them into another layer of forward and backward things. Uh, uh, sort of the uh, best performing uh, uh, machine translation systems tend to stack a couple of layers of, of this, but uh, um, the, uh, a one layer model works, uh, works quite well and uh, it makes, makes the point. So then what we're going to do is we're going to concatenate uh, these two parts uh, of the model and build, uh, build our matrix. Um, and so this is going to be then the representation uh, of, of the sentence. And uh, this will then be uh, what gets passed on to uh, the decoder. Um, <clears throat> uh, I guess, you know, it's important to ask where we are uh, in, in 2018. Um, there are still lots and lots of ways to construct F. The one that I haven't really talked about here, or I haven't talked about at all, is uh, using convolutions on these things. Convolutions are nice because, uh, as I said, they can be implemented very efficiently. Uh, you can, uh, so RNNs, in order to compute the value at HT, uh, or at time T, you have to be able to compute uh, you have to know the value of ht minus 1, which requires knowing ht minus 2. So there is a, um, synchronous, there's a serialization bottleneck that, that has to happen. Um, convolutions can uh, happen in parallel, uh, and uh, they have a fixed receptive field, but if you make that receptive field big enough, um, you can still condition on any sort of reasonably sized sentence or at least assume that uh, the representation at this time is going to be independent of anything that happened that far away. Um, so convolutions are nice if you are very concerned about being able to parallelize uh, this stuff, although I think they still underperform uh, most of the recurrent network um, architectures, although that is a contentious matter. Um, there's also been some work on uh, conditioning. So when you build a representation of a sentence, uh, it makes sense to just read the words. The words are very 
uh, obviously uh, there in the data. Um, but there were some questions yesterday for Slav about why do we do this parsing stuff? Like, you know, isn't this like an old-fashioned approach to, to NLP? Um, we want to use machine learning. Um, well, here's an answer. So one of the things they found is that especially in small data problems, uh, if you represent, if you feed into the RNN, rather than just uh, the word, you also feed in information about the uh, syntactic uh, um, neighborhood that that word occurs in. Uh, so say what its uh, parent and grandparent are in a, in a phrase structure tree, um, you can get uh, better uh, representations that result in better generalization. Um, and this is particularly true in small data um, uh, cases, but also in languages where there are uh, fairly large scale word order divergences. Um, so, so this is another way of improving the representations, not by changing the architecture, but by changing what gets fed in. Um, so another thing that uh, I think is a, a big mystery is, uh, you know, we know that words are uh, sometimes the minimal carriers of meaning. Um, and in translation, we often find it's even useful to work with things that are smaller than uh, units. But we also know that words tend to group together into phrases that have idiosyncratic meanings. And figuring out ways to uh, deal with uh, multi-word expressions and the fact that we know something about the structure uh, of, of how words group together to form meanings uh, seems, uh, seems very important. And yes, we can hope to learn this from a lot of data, but we might also design some models that, uh, that build uh, this knowledge in. Um, because we're now about to turn to a question of where our insight about how the translation process probably works is going to be crucial to the, to the improvements that this matrix representation has given us. So our insight about how the problem actually works led us to a good solution. So the intuition about this is going to uh, help us solve the problem. How do we decode from a matrix? So we saw in uh, the Kalkbrenner and Bluntsum model, we had our input sentence represented by a vector. And at every time, we just added in the vector when we were uh, computing our next representation from which we were going to uh, compute the probability distribution over the next word. This was, uh, this was all, uh, all very nice. Um, the intuition for uh, the solution to this problem is that at every time step, a translator is going to be looking at a different part of the input when making a decision about what to translate. Now, in order to decide what the sort of next thing to look at, they might need to look several places at once, but their attention is going to be moving around a sentence. And in fact, if you uh, look at translators while they're translating a, uh, a document, uh, you'll see that they uh, they refer back to the source sentence intermittently while they are uh, generating the outputs. Um, actually, it's a little more complicated than that. The very best translators do actually uh, have some kind of profound ability to, to sort of uh, read very large units and then just produce lots. But uh, almost uh, the vast majority spend a lot of time kind of moving back and forth uh, between, uh, between the two things. Um, and so that's exactly uh, what... Uh, Dmitry Badnow um, uh, proposed uh, uh, in uh, 2015 to, uh, to solve this problem. So here's the high level idea. We're going to still generate the output sentence word by word using an RNN. At each output position T, the RNN is going to receive two inputs um, in addition to the recurrent inputs. First, a fixed size vector embedding of the previously generated output symbol ET minus 1. So this is just this, this recurrent uh, connection from the previously sampled word that we always have. Um, and second, a fixed size vector encoding a view of the input matrix. So how do we get a fixed size vector from a matrix that changes over time? So what Badenow et al. did was take a weighted sum of the columns of F, where the columns roughly represent the words, um, based on how important they are at the current time step. So this is, of course, just a matrix vector product. So if we have some attention uh, weights at time t, let's call it a t, this is just the product f times a t. Um, and uh, the weighting of the input columns at each time step uh, a t is called the, the attention. So it's basically going to decide where in the input uh, we're, going to, uh, we're going to attend. Um, and then 
we're going to have, we're going to attend, so we're going to have also a different model uh, of um, where to attend, or we're going to have a model that predicts where to attend from one time step to the next. And the thing to note here, this all works because we have a fixed number of columns in this F matrix, even though, the, sorry, we have a fixed number of rows in this F matrix, even though the number of columns is determined by the length of the sentence. So once we've aggregated all of these things together, we've got a predictably sized vector. So all of the, uh, all of the operations we want to uh, conti we want to then you know do to compute uh, the new value of HT uh, work as they did in the uh, in the previous decoder. So um, let's look at this. So here's our here's our RNN. So normally we start with the start symbol, we get some uh, output representation, and we sample, um, and then we feed this in, uh, and then we repeat the process uh, recurrently. Um, this is going to be very uh, similar here, except what we're going to do is we're going to start with our start symbol. Um, we're going to compute uh, a, uh, a representation of the, of the input. Um, and then we're going to say, aha, in addition to this uh, um, conditioning on the previously generated symbol or in the, at the beginning the start symbol, we're also going to want to attend to this input matrix that we've got off to the side here. And so what we're going to do is use the previous hidden state in the RNN. So at the beginning of the uh, at the beginning of decoding, this can be uh, H0. Um, I will say there are a couple of different variants of this. I'm giving the Batna variant. There are, there are a variety of different ones. They all work roughly equivalently. Um, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take that vector and we're going to compute some uh, either. You can think about it as a similarity function that basically says, how much does that, uh, does at least a component of that hidden vector like each column of this vector? And so we're going to get a score for every column of the vector. And we're going to renormalize that into a uh, probability distribution, or well, rather, to, uh, we're going to pass it through a softmax, so we, it's not a probability distribution. We use, we don't treat it probabilistically, but it's a vector that has one value for every column in the matrix, and those values are z between 0 and 1, and they sum uh, to 1. And then we're going to uh, multiply this um, by uh, this vector by this matrix, and this will give us a second input, which we'll call C1 for the first context vector. So FA1 gives us C1, and then this becomes uh, the second input. So you can think about this alternatively as just concatenating uh, the embedding of the previous word with the, uh, with the context embedding, uh, and then that updates, uh, and we compute then H1. Um, now we project this out. Uh, we compute H1. We project it out onto uh, the target vocabulary, and we sample um, a, uh, the first word. Um, now we repeat the process. Um, we embed uh, the word we've just sampled. Um, we're now going to take the previous uh, hidden state uh, in the output decoder, uh, run the same function where we uh, compare that hidden vector. We use that to query this matrix and compute a score for each of these columns, uh, renormalize that into uh, uh, this vector here. Uh, and then you multiply the matrix and the vector to compute the second context vector. Uh, and this process uh, proceeds until we sample uh, a stop symbol. Um, and one of the interesting things, now I made these, uh, I made these values up here, but they, um, one thing you'll see is if you look at the history of attention masks, is they have a somewhat intuitive correspondence to where uh, the words that you are translating live in the sentence. So you can see a kind of alignment between the translation you're producing uh, and, the, uh, and the input. Now, um, this is often a very good, uh, this makes a lot of sense, especially when you're looking at the outputs of your system. If you're trying to understand data, sometimes uh, you'll see that the attention for uh, some data you trained on uh, isn't actually a very good correspondence with the um, uh, the, the data that you trained on isn't well matched by the attentions, but because of how we do decoding with greedy decoding, we end up seeing a good correspondence between our outputs and where we're attending. Um, so I'll show some examples of, uh, of real attention in, in just a moment. 
Um, but uh, the big question is, of course, how do we know uh, what to attend to at each, uh, at each time step? So how do we compute A sub T? And there are a couple of models uh, that have been proposed out here. Um, what we need to do is, um, so I'm going to give a simplified version of a Badenow solution. Um, so let's call the hidden states um, ST uh, for, uh, that we're generating by the uh, um, uh, output uh, decoder. And uh, at time T, we're going to compute a query key embedding just by taking a uh, linear transformation of this um, of this hidden state. So the reason we want to do this is because that hidden state has a lot of responsibilities. It needs to be useful for figuring out where to attend in the input next. Um, it also needs to remember the context that uh, it's currently in when generating the target sentence. Um, so you need to make sure you're generating fluent output. There are things that aren't in translations that aren't just purely a function of the source language, they aren't just pure translations, they also have to be reflecting, your, your translations also have to reflect the rules of the target language. So when you're translating from Chinese into English, you have to decide whether something is singular or plural, uh, and uh, that will affect then uh, w whether a verb has one form uh, or another. Uh, if you're translating from English into Portuguese and you produce an, a noun, it's going to be, uh, it's going to have uh, a masculine or feminine gender, which the English noun may not have, and that's going to affect the form of the Portuguese verb. Um, and so uh, these things are best modeled, or one approach to modeling them, you might think the learner might decide to put this information just in the target language decoder. It might not try and recover this information from the source sentence every time it, uh, um, every time it needs it. So um, this linear map, what it lets you do is take out the information that isn't necessary for finding out where to attend next. Um, so V is, uh, it's very important to, to have this, co this learnable component in here. Um, so then we can do something simple where we take the dot product, so we've got this vector RT, and we can just take the dot product between every column of F and this RT, and that's going to give us a, a kind of similarity score. Um, and we can call this uh, the attention, uh, this is called the attention energy in Badenow's paper, um, and then we can just renormalize this uh, with a uh, with a softmax, um, right? Um, so then, finally, the input source vector, this context vector at time t, is just the product of this matrix F times uh, times a t. Okay. Um, so the in the actual model, uh, it's fairly common to use a slightly more complicated thing than dot product. So rather than uh, rather than having this uh, simple dot product model. Uh, they instead use a, um, uh, a they introduce a nonlinearity there where um, you can learn slightly more complex functions. Um, sometimes this works better, sometimes it doesn't. Um, it's kind of something you should try. Um, and uh, yeah, so here we have two sets of parameters, V uh, and W, um, but uh, yeah, try it. Um, so finally, we can put this together, um, and we can write an entire translation model uh, in, in one slide. Uh, the code in uh, uh, most frameworks these days isn't actually sort of terribly more complicated than this. Um, so one of the big uh, you know, things that's nice these days is that deep learning is so easy because of the good tools we've got. Um, so uh, we start off by uh, uh, encoding our input sentence as this matrix F. Um, and then we've got this big while loop that starts with uh, uh, E0 as the special start symbol. Um, we start with a special uh, start state for the decoder, RNN. Um, you can either learn this. Um, in the original work, what they do is they, uh, sort of inspired by the Ilya Siskiver work on taking the uh, reversed input sentence as the initial state of the decoder, they initialize by taking the reverse RNN that they read the input sentence with and then transforming that and that becomes the initial state uh, of the RNN that, the, uh, that they decode from. Uh, and then they uh, just loop until they sample a uh, stop symbol. Um, they compute uh, attention as we just described 
They compute the context vector for the time step. They update their RNN using the previous uh, hidden state, uh, st minus uh, 1, together with an embedding of the previous, uh, previously sampled word and the current attention. Uh, they compute a probability distribution over the vocabulary, and then they sample a word uh, from uh, this probability distribution. So this is the generative model uh, story for, for how, this, uh, how this data comes to be. And then, of course, you can do things like uh, use beam search to find the most probable translation. And at training time, uh, instead of sampling, you're going to be computing a, uh, a cross-entropy uh, penalty at, uh, at each of these positions. Um, and, that's, uh, and that's everything. And this is basically how machine translation works uh, to even, uh, even up to uh, today. Um, so one other thing that's worth noting here is that um, you know you have this matrix vector, you have this matrix matrix product here uh, inside uh, this loop. Um, you know use good sense in uh, in optimizing these things and uh, you know pull this out uh, so you don't have to do so much computation. These are still very expensive models uh, to train, even with lots of GPUs and uh, and nice uh, um, uh, fast um, uh, frameworks, but. Uh, um, you know, pay attention to things like this. So, um, when this paper came out, um, uh, the results were really uh, quite impressive. Um, adding attention to the sequence-to-sequence -sequence translation model of, uh, of Sutskever et al. Um, improved the blue score uh, by 11, um, which was a um, you know sort of the moment the world kind of. Sat up and said, "Okay, wait. This is a this is a huge innovation in how we were doing everything. We're all going to stop." Uh, and I don't think anybody uh, kept working on uh, phrase-based, uh, which was the previous uh, uh, systems for machine translation. Uh, at that point, it just became, uh, you know, clear that this was uh, this was there was a lot of really exciting work uh, to be done um, in this new in this new framework. Hmm. Um, one of the other things that's uh, quite interesting about this, um, about these models, is that you can look, as I said, at the uh, at where the model is attending uh, to generate data, um, and you see that it does correspond quite uh, uh, quite well to our intuitive notions of uh, uh, of these alignments between uh, sentences. Um, they uh, are not always completely sensible, but you'll see. Um, so uh, here we've got this sentence, like the agreement on the European economic area was signed in August 1992. So European economic uh, area, when it translates uh, uh, into French, um, is like a zone economique européenne. Um, so it's like uh, reversed uh, the order. And we see um, here this mostly diagonal uh, monotonic uh, alignment between French and uh, uh, and English, but uh, we see this uh, um, this shift um, captured. Now, um, these are sort of cherry-picked nice examples that I put in the slides because they, they make the point nicely, um, but they, uh, and they don't always look quite this nice, um, but it is certainly, uh, these are the sorts of things that we'd like to be able to do when we understand what our model is doing. Uh, so for example, if we looked and we had seen a bad output that then was attending and also that the attention was going somewhere else, that would be an indication that there was something wrong with our attention model. And we would either try and change our attention model or we might want to uh, <clears throat> figure out why the attention model had decided to look uh, where it had looked. Uh, so, so having the, uh, the ability to do this kind of analysis uh, is, is quite nice and uh, not something that is easily done in sequence-to-sequence sequence sequence models. Um, so, so this uh, represents an improvement in sort of two ways, both in terms of performance and in terms of intelligibility. Um, so let me say uh, a quick word about uh, what's going on with gradients, because we've talked about the difficulties of long-range gradient flow uh, in, uh, in RNNs all morning. and. Um, and uh, this actually, I think, has an interesting uh, solution to them. So imagine uh, we're uh, at training time now, and we are 
we're here on, we're generating the, uh, um, we'd like to generate the word beer, that's what the training data uh, says we, we should be doing. And so we're going to compute a probability distribution over the next word, and we're going to compute the cross entropy with this one hot uh, impulse distribution on the word beer. Um, and we're going to get some error. And now we're going to need to uh, we're going to need to update it. And um, the amount, if our attention was, let's say, at the right place, that when we went to generate this next word we were attending very strongly to this column. So what I've done here is I've weighted these columns kind of by the, the attention weight, so you see they're grayed out a little bit, re reflecting that we're att attending most strongly uh, to this column. When we backpropagate, we're going to intuitively weight the, uh, not intuitive, but we're going to exactly weight the gradient that flow back to each of these input positions by the amount we're attending to the uh, that input position. So if we're attending in the right place, we're going to be sent, and if we predicted, say, uh, the right uh, translation or the wrong translation of beer, we're going to be able to go and fix the input representation quite precisely. We don't have to, say, traverse the entire sequence that we've generated and then go back uh, into the encoding of the source sentence the way we did in, say, uh, the Sutskiever model. Uh, here we've got a direct connection uh, to this to this input uh, column, which uh, can make learning uh, quite a bit uh, quite a bit easier. So these models are are much easier uh, to train uh, than the uh, than the Sutskiever uh, model. And uh, I think actually that was one of the uh, I heard an early presentation of this work, uh, and you know they said well they tried to replicate the. Um, the Siskiver results, and it was they just didn't have the resources to, to be able to train this. But uh, um, you know, this model you can train on a on a single GPU uh, easily enough. Okay. Um, so when I saw this work presented, it was actually by uh, tonight's speaker, uh, Kyung Yang Cho, um, and he asked um, whether translators read and memorize the input sentence. Uh, or document and then generate the output, and obviously they don't. They attend back and forth. Um, and you can sort of think about compressing the entire input sequence into a vector. It basically says you've got to memorize the entire, uh, the entire sequence, and uh, that's, uh, that's a bad idea. Um, but I think this brings up a kind of really important question for us all to, to keep in mind as we work on uh, artificial intelligence. Um, which is whether humans should be a model for, uh, for machines. Um, and uh, it, you know, in, in a domain like language where the only successful language users in the universe, as far as we know, are human beings, uh, it certainly makes sense to, uh, to look at uh, the solutions that we've, uh, that we've come up with, and, uh, um, and we should feel free to deviate from them. I mean, we deviate in uh, our artificial machines uh, from nat nature solutions very often. Our airplanes don't flap their wings and things like that. Um, but at the same time, we should, uh, you know, we don't yet have things that approach uh, human abilities with language. So it makes sense to continue studying uh, humans. So uh, I'm going to also uh, respond to the question that Slav was given, which is why should we worry about things like syntax? Well, we have a great deal of evidence that uh, human minds are processing uh, things according to syntactic structures, and uh, you know they're doing something well with language. Um, and we have a great deal of evidence that, given enough data, LSTMs can learn uh, a lot of uh, uh, learn things very well. Uh, but we can see that if we do use something that we know about data generating processes to uh, to motivate architectural improvements, um, we sometimes can have huge, uh, uh, hugely successful uh, changes. So um, I'd say. <coughs> We, should, we shouldn't uh, slavishly follow uh, sort of human uh, intuitions about these things, uh, but as a source of what to do next, uh, human beings can provide uh, a very, very rich source of, uh, um, uh, of inspiration. So let's, uh, let's keep that in mind. Um, so um, we're just getting here uh, to the end, so I want to summarize with uh, um, sort of a few bigger points uh, from, from this lecture. Um, um, so the first thing is uh, attention, uh, you know, provides this really important ability, which is uh, to create direct information flows directly uh, from uh, from the distant, I should say, past 
Um, so this is closely related to pooling operations that you see uh, in convolutional architectures, uh, but it's much more dynamic in the sense that uh, it, uh, it changes over time, whereas pooling is usually just a deterministic function that doesn't, uh, doesn't really evolve uh, in the same way. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I think the traditional attention models are still um, a little bit naive. So we, we did, uh, you know, attention is a great idea, but uh, sort of how we decide where to attend is, uh, um, is still a, uh, a hard problem. And uh, we've started to see work on adding structural biases, uh, things like uh, the fact that once you've attended to a few words in a row in one position, you're probably going to continue to attend around that area. That's probably where the relevant information is. Um, and, uh, th but there's still like a lot more, uh, a lot more information. Um, and I think this is true whether you're working on translation or uh, image captioning or uh, document understanding or things like that. They, uh, correlations across time are extremely, uh, extremely informative. And, uh, uh, and so this is something that we haven't really got a good handle on. Um, but there's, uh, um, there are definitely some, some interesting applications there. Um, another uh, interesting possibility here is uh, the factorization of the retrieval problem uh, seems interesting. So um, we are doing what's sometimes called content-based retrieval, where we have, we're retrieving the thing that we're also using to query against. Uh, but in fact, it seems like we might want to separate the representation that we use to represent the position in the sentence that we attend to from the thing that we actually then retrieve when we are uh, when we're retrieving uh, when we uh, once we've attended to that position. Um, so uh, again, you know, these in in the limit of of lots of data and a very good learner, uh, these sorts of things may not matter. Um, but uh, as we want to improve uh, robustness to uh, uh, to small data and solve problems where we don't have naturally occurring data uh, on the order of millions of uh, examples, uh, being able to uh, have biases like this can be, uh, um, can be important. Um, finally, uh, I'll say attention is, uh, is, is nice because it provides uh, some in something you can look at to understand what your, uh, what your model is doing. So, you know, if it worked as well as uh, Siskiever's model, um, it would still have some value, I think, that uh, uh, in that regard, because it lets you do something that was not easy to do, um, not easy to do otherwise. So um, that's uh, that's about it. We've got a few minutes uh, here at the end for questions. So uh, please uh, let me let me know what you want to know. So I saw, yeah, one up here. How we want to sample a probability distribution and feed that. So like basically at time step t, we want to be aware of uh, the choice we made at time step t minus one and feed that back in rather than the probability distribution. And that makes perfect sense for um, training. But then uh, during prediction, it seems like this is a, a recipe for, for error propagation, basically. So I'm wondering, is there, um, I kind of see it as uh, there might be two alternatives where um, one is that during training, we feed in sort of a probability distribution where we've enforced uh, that most of the probability goes on the right thing that we want to predict. And then during prediction time, we, we feed in the softmax output such that basically the point is that if we're doing uh, post tagging, for example, and um, at time step t minus one, we predict noun because noun has 51% uh, probability but then let's say verb has uh, the other 49%, wouldn't we want to let the model know on the next time step that we, might uh, we likely might have made a mistake? Or like basically that we were very uh, uncertain about the previous 
prediction, so maybe we would want to sort of keep that information for the next time step. Or yeah. I guess the alternative would be to uh, weight all the representations of the predictions by how certain we were about them, such that we would fit in 51% of the noun representation and 49% of the verb one. Um, yeah, it's an, it's a, uh, I like the suggestion. Uh, I, I will say, so, um, we, there, so there, there are a couple of parts to the answer. So one is to bring back this notion of decision theory, which is um, we, uh, you know, the decision of what we actually choose at every time step is, um, is, is rather, uh, you know, divorced from what we, the probability distribution just is an estimate of what we think is going to happen. What we actually want to choose from that probability distribution, what actually does happen, uh, is a different is a different question. Um, but still, knowing whether some, you saw something that was surprising or unsurprising could be very useful in letting the model know what to do next. Because in training, there are going to be things that happen quite rarely, and maybe a very informative. Uh, uh, feature for what the model should do next is really whether something rare happened at some time or rather something, whether something completely predictable happened. And so by feeding in the, the certainty that was uh, associated with that previous prediction, you might make that more salient to the model. So it might make that, uh, it might make that generalization better. However, um, because the model computes the, uncer the certainties or the uncertainties over all of the words, um, using that hidden state at the previous time step, um, it in principle has all the information it needs to know to compute that. So if you have a particular reason why uh, you think in this domain that kind of information is crucially important, um, yes, by all means encode it in the input and make it, make it more salient. Um, and I could actually imagine uh, this sounds interesting. I, I could imagine it works um, for, for certain problems, maybe, maybe even for language. Um, but uh, the uh, but it's still quite different from the problem of needing to feed in the samples that we've actually uh, produced. So um, the that whatever process we sample by, still uh, we have to say what happened um, outside of the model. You know what decision was made using that model. Uh, to update it uh, with sort of the most current information about the world. And because that process was in some sense external uh, to the model, it ha we have to feed that information in, otherwise we're losing information that is crucial for making good subsequent predictions. Is it also the case that it's an external decision if we just always take the argmax? Uh, it is. Um, because we aren't training, uh, so if if we trained the model to always take uh, the arg max, um, well, I don't really know what that would look like because I don't know what the loss uh, function would be. I mean, so a probabilistic loss means you have probabilistic semantics, um, and if you uh, you trained it, so basically then you'd have a mismatch between the training. Uh, and the testing uh, procedure. So from the model's perspective, it was trained probabilistically. So the argmax was, although it's deterministic, um, you, the, prob the model is a probability model. So it, needs, it sees samples. So you have to give it samples. And the fact that you have this deterministic rule for how you sample, it's still a sample uh, it, it, from the model's perspective. <coughs> Um, that you could basically operate on an infinitely long input sequence. Yes. So it seems like we gave up on this. What are like smart ways to use attention in infinitely long sentences or sequences? So you can use attention on, on infinitely long, uh, well, uh, unboundedly long sequences. We can't actually have a, uh, a sequence of, of infinite length. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we certainly can attend uh, to them. Uh, one thing we do see is that uh, LSTMs generalize very badly uh, beyond the range of lengths that they were uh, that they were trained on, um, and this was uh, 
this was a concern in the earliest days of lstms where they tried to look at what problems and how will they generalize beyond you know if you train on short sequences with a very specific say generation rule of what's kind of in the language and out of the language do they learn the right generalization rule and there's actually a paper this year from you of goldberg and colleagues that looks at whether it can lstms or grooves learn a to the n b to the n and they found that lstms actually do learn it they learn the general rule basically but grooves fail and there's actually a simple analysis showing why this why this is they actually use a one of the cells to learn to count and then when they're counting the a's and then when they decrement when they're learning when they're seeing the b's and then at the end if that's zero then they've succeeded and only lstms can can do this grooves can't but and you sometimes do actually see learning of this nature but for real domains like language the problem is complicated enough the underlying grammar is complicated enough that we're getting a very surfacey kind of approximation I think to the to the rules that are that are governing this and so you can do okay if you are sort of within the range of sentence length that you've seen during training but when you get outside of it you the models tend to that behave quite badly um, and I think this is, so I think there, it's just a matter of correcting the biases of the model and making them a little bit more, uh, a little bit more uh, sensible. So encouraging them to develop better abstractions. Um, so the point of syntax, uh, again, for example, in linguistic theory is to characterize how sentences can grow in predictable ways uh, without seeming, bene without, you know, apparently, kind of suddenly becoming very different when they get longer from what they are when they're shorter. And um, so perhaps by uh, uh, training uh, a sequence to sequence transducer with attention jointly with a syntactic parser will encourage the development of better latent representations that uh, enable better generalization across lengths. So there's been some work doing that. There's been uh, results showing that these models can give you better blue scores. I don't know if they looked, I don't remember if they looked specifically at whether sort of these length problems uh, are better uh, uh, addressed when you have uh, this syntactic information used during training, but yeah. Okay. Okay, um, no further questions. So one important thing, guys. Oh, oh, there's one question there, where? Oh, sorry. Uh, can you explain a bit how we deal with longer sequences? For example, uh, each RNN has a size, say I have 500 units, and if my sequence is of 1,000 words, how does the unrolling work of this RNN? So is each state a combination of multiple words or? That's a good question. So uh, there's a very nice paper uh, from uh, Dan Jurafsky and colleagues uh, uh, that just came out uh, in the last uh, month or two uh, that looks at what, um, what these RNNs are representing in their, um, in their hidden units. And they do, this, they do some very clever experiments to, um, to try and tease this apart. So they manipulate when they go to predict the next word uh, in a probability distribution, they rerun the RNN with the same parameters, but they manipulate the history and look at what changes the predictions of the of the next uh, probability, uh, the computation of the next probability distribution. And what they find is that in a fairly short range, um, like less than ten words, I'm sure, uh, word order is encoded, and there is uh, some sensitivity to that. Um, but if you look at much longer ranges, um, up to even hundreds of words, uh, there actually is some encoding of what words were mentioned, but it's more of a bag of words encoding. So the RNN learns to basically remember locally some details about the word order, but then once you step back, it remembers sort of roughly what's being talked about. Um, and I think that's actually a kind of sensible first order approximation of, of language. If you want to generate things, that's going um, that's to get you a long way. Thank you. Okay. Now we're done. Okay. So one